Well, that wasn't intended. Why does this keep happening? excuse for being late. Uh, OBS, where are you? There you are. Uh, so, hello, Video Dojo. Thank you for coming. Yes, I know my mic is up there. I hope my audio is all right. I don't know if my audio is all right. Uh, yeah, so, uh, ding dang, heavens. Oh, the yellow line, right. That's an alignment mark. I use it for um, getting my, uh, my camera uh, hang on, just a second. Do, 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 do. I use that. Um, OBS is actually part of my production chain. Like when I'm doing a, a studio video, um, it's what puts the preview image on my TV because when I switch inputs, when I switch angles, um, when I'm shooting from multiple angles, I want to be able to see what's happening from those other angles. And so I route everything, all my cameras through OBS, and then I'm able to uh, switch it remotely with a foot pedal. Um, it turns out that you can either you can either buy one of you know millions of just horrible AliExpress grade video switchers with terrible little membrane remotes that are not going to work reliably, or you can just run the shit through OBS, and then you can do stuff like that, like put the uh, the uh, alignment mark in there, or uh, for instance. Um, when I'm shooting a video that's got like a VGA capture, I just put it up there and then I can look up the screen and see it's a confidence monitor, right? <laughs> I only did this recently. I don't know why I didn't do it sooner. I guess I thought that having the PC be a linchpin in the production chain would be a bad idea, but it really, it's been fine, you know? Anyway, this video, uh, this stream is kind of a test because I just rebuilt my studio computer because it was making too much noise during recordings but like I said I need it because it's part of the the cat the um the signal flow for the for the actual shoots uh so I just rebuilt it with that ridiculous um the gigantic passive cooler that Noctua sells that's literally like this it's a heat sink that's like this big it's nuts it's like the size of a like a volleyball uh but uh yeah totally passive um uh, people say they use them on like uh, i9 12th gens and, and stuff like that. I pulled the boom mic down. Who cares? You know, there's a cable over there. Who gives a shit? It's a live stream. Um, and I just decided, like, I just want my machine to be virtually fanless. Because what it had was a pump for an AIO water cooler, and then it had fans in the front and the back, and then I had an RTX, like, 2070 in there that I'd retired from something else. And, I'm just, like, it would just periodically get too noisy, and I had no way to deal with it. So I put a passive cooler in there, and a Intel Arc A380. Uh, so what you're looking at right now is AV1. I'm sending YouTube AV1, never done that before. Uh, so I think it looks just as bad as it did before. I don't think there's really been any improvement, um, <laughs> but whatever, you know. Uh, this is the, the ASRock Challenger that's supposed to be like a super quiet GPU and I think that's true. I think that's true. I don't know. I haven't fully evaluated it yet. But it's something where I, I think I said this in a video a long time ago. I had always wanted to have uh, an Intel ARC card. Not because I necessarily think that, uh, uh, that it's going to be the future of graphics or even that they're going to keep doing it, but because I don't think they're going to keep doing it. I think that it's going to be a, um, it's going to be a thing that we remember. Yeah, exactly. Like that's the thing is I I I don't really see a difference. Uh, it's not more efficient or anything. It's just that theoretically that's what the future is supposed to be. So I figured 
I want to have an art card. I wanted to make this PC quieter. The art card's only a hundred bucks, you know? And um, so I figured it was, I might as well. I'll, I'm trying a thing, trying, you know, a bit of the future. Because computers got so boring for so long, right? Like for, for most of the last 20 years, you bought an NVIDIA card if you could afford it. And that was pretty much the end of it. And then it just worked. Um, after like 2005, the majority of the driver issues with both brands really got a lot less common. Um, there was a lot less like stuff you can only do on one card, you know, and things like that. And yeah, AMD may have kept up, but it didn't matter because if, if, if you didn't, you could just buy a GeForce card if you had the money for it and you'd be pretty much happy. You were going to get a completely cromulent system. Uh, and so computers just got really boring. You know, you buy any parts, you put them together, you mostly get a computer. Great. Uh, but what I love about the Intel Arc is that computers used to be bad, uh, and this brings it back. Like, this this brings back computers being broken. Because um, now we've got, like, oh, driver issues, and whoops, your BIOS doesn't have the right setting turned on, so your perf dropped by 75%. And uh, whoops, Intel dropped a bombed release for the drive. Yeah, and so on and so forth. So I really wanted to get... Because NVIDIA and AMD had gotten so good at their jobs that computers were just boring. There were no problems anymore. No chaos. And I, I really, if Intel stops making these, and I think they probably will, even if they're successful, they probably are successful, but they're not infinitely, unbelievably, unimaginably, indescribably successful, and they're never going to be. They're not going to displace NVIDIA. That's not happening. And so it won't be enough. It won't be enough for the, the corpor corporation brain. They'll, they'll cancel a perfectly good product that millions of people are buying uh, because uh, it's, it's, it's not hundreds of millions. So anyway, uh, uh, so Bitmapper, I, I have not tested this myself, but I read a bunch of people saying, yeah, I did a bunch of tests and with, with rebar off, I got 75% less performance. And uh, I, I don't know. I don't know. Um, uh, I'll, maybe I'll test it myself. So I can now. I can do it now. Uh, yeah, th there you go, right? Like, y y y there's there's all sorts of wild shit now. Because it used to be you either got an Intel chip, and they were just, you get the cheap one or the expensive one. Or you get a server chip. You get a, an Opteron or a Xeon. Well, now we've got wild shit like the Epic and the Threadripper. You know, these ridiculous CPUs with potentially ridiculous limitations that never used to... It's great. It's great. I love it. Uh, anyway, but the, the great thing is because the ARC cards are so cheap, uh, I wanted to get one just at some point. I, I may not always use it in this computer. Maybe I'll put the NVIDIA back or maybe I'll, I'll do something else entirely. I don't know. But now I have it, right? So when... Um, <clears throat> pardon me. When... Uh, uh, Someday, when they give up on this, I will have a piece of this history. The same reason I got the, the, the Stream Deck. Yes, I have notions about the video render server, but that's a whole complicated thing. Okay, anyway, um, but uh, this stream started much later than intended because we just spent the whole day rebuilding this computer, so I want to get to it. So, we have many things. We have many things. These are my EGA monitors. Very exciting. Very exciting stuff. Uh, let me... Boop. Boop. There we go. Let me, let me get you acquainted. So, this, let me just focus up here. Sorry for the on-screen graphics. I just realized that those are there. Uh, they, do, they do give it a little bit of flavor. I guess I could just leave them. They are kind of fun. Um, does anybody mind the OSD? Should I turn the OSD off? <laughs> There's no time code. Well, anyway. <clears throat> All right, so this here is a, uh, <laughs> this is the wackiest, nuttiest monitor I've ever owned. This is a Micro VTech Definition. That's the name down there, Definition. And this thing has an incredible story. Incredible story. Oh, hey, Comp Geek, how's it going? You're gonna like the way you look. This thing is a, <laughs> this thing is a banger. Uh, so the spectrogram is real time. See, black magic baby. So what this is, is a computer video monitor from 1990 
made by Microvitech, a company who are best known, if they're known at all, uh, for having made the monitors that went with the BBC Micro and similar systems, a series called uh, the Microvitech Cub. Now, this is interesting because we're talking 80s British electronics, okay? So normally you think of that and you think like ZX Spectrum. You, <laughs> you think, you know, uh, uh, so we, we figured out how to use the memory bus as a serial port. So <laughs> if you're writing anything to serial, you can't read from memory. Just really, really cheap crap, right? Uh, just very dismal uh, products for the most part with significant outliers. Uh, but the BBC Micro was one of those. The computer itself was uh, a really impressive achievement, way ahead of its time, uh, very forward-thinking design, lots of capabilities. Um, and lag? Someone said lag. Is there lag? We having dropouts? Uh, does OBS say there's any dropouts? Oh, hey, would you look at that? OBS does say dropped frames, 552. I wonder why that is. Um, we're gonna talk over. We're gonna talk over the back. Don't worry. Okay. Well, we'll we'll see if that happens again. If that dropout happens again, I may need to lower my my uh, frame rate. Um, but at any rate, so uh, apparently, <clears throat> sorry, phone was vibrating. Apparently, uh, uh, Micro VTech made these monitors way better than they absolutely needed to. Like a lot of home computer monitors were garbage. The, um, I'm trying to remember here, I believe that the original uh, Radio Shack TRS-80 uh, monitor was literally just a rebadged uh, TV set that they sold that just had the RF tuner ripped out of it. Just super cut rate stuff, very low quality, subject to noise and interference and, and all sorts of things. So, <clears throat> I don't know if you're picking up that chair rolling overhead, but uh, anyway, um, uh, so, uh, early home computer television, sorry, I'm a little frazzled today, uh, bear with me. Early home computer monitors were just crap. A lot of the time they were just plain televisions, um, sometimes with the whole RF mechanism ripped out, sometimes they were just, you know, I think just channel three. Here's a TV, it's literally just a TV. Uh, but there were exceptions, and the Micro VTech Cub is one of them. I don't remember all the details on it. Um, one of my friends is, is way more up on it than me, but... Uh, because he is fascinated by the BBC Micro and the Acorn um, computers in general, he has been really looking into the Micro VTech and finding out all these things about the Cub monitors. He says they're very impressive, very well built, lots of capabilities. Wow. Uh, never. Damn, dude. Got like a dance routine going on up there? Dragging a body around? This will be over in a couple minutes. <laughs> but. Um, Anyway, so we went to eBay and just looked up Microvitech, Micro and uh, there's not much on there. there. There were U.S. market cub monitors, uh, and he does have a couple of those. Uh, they're not terribly common, but they do exist. Uh, but Microvitech made a lot of other displays, and this one happened to be on eBay. I'm sorry we bought them all. <laughs> Me and my friends bought them all. It was a, a lot of very rare uh, displays were never going to show up again, so we just bought them out. Um, and you're not likely to ever see them again. I'm sorry. Uh, it was an amazing deal, and uh, I bought it specifically because this does some things that I'd never been able to do with any other monitor that I've ever seen. Specifically, EGA graphics. Okay, I'll talk about the monitor itself, but I, I need to prime you for why the hell I wanted it. So, it's a well-known thing that you know, the video games, the, the popular video games of the IBM personal computer uh, didn't weren't, weren't really much of a thing up until EGA came out. CGA did not really deliver satisfactory graphics um, at all, period. So there were pretty much no good uh, CGA games. They just didn't exist. I've played them all. They're garbage. Uh, Bruce Lee is about as good as it gets. And yeah, I know, there's the whole composite artifact. It looked like shit, okay? You could not get a picture out of the CGA card that didn't look like shit. I know what I'm talking about. <laughs> there's no exceptions to this. Those games sucked. And they were worse than what was coming out on contemporary computers because from 81 to 83, 84, while people were playing games on like the TRS-80 Coco and 
uh, the VIC-20 and, you know, when the C64 came out and whatnot, all during the reign of the CGA, uh, those games looked a lot better. In 81, there weren't that many good choices for uh, per-pixel bitmap graphics in color on a home computer, but just like a year or two later, it got much, much better. And I would argue that in some ways, the CGA was worse than the Apple II, but anyway. The point is, CGA sucks. I've played Alley Cat. It's okay. It's not what it wants to be, and it looked better on other platforms. Yes, it, the only saving grace about it is that the default color palette is the trans pride colors. But other than that, there's only so much you can do with that, you know. So uh, then IBM comes out with the EGA in 1984. And what's up? Some yeah, I just heard that there were some weird glitches. What kind of glitches? Uh, it looked like the camera feed cut out for a second. What, like, did we did we see, like, I saw, no like, video? Graphics. Uh -huh. Camera has power, right? Yeah. Bing bong. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, teething issues. Teething issues. What with the new setup and everything. We had to unplug all the cables, plug them all back in and everything. By the way, is my audio all right? Is my audio doing okay? Yeah. Uh, people are saying that... Oh, you know what? We just dropped some more frames. Honey, can you go in? Oh, I can go in. Never mind. I've got the keyboard. Sorry, folks. Uh, yeah, we're dropping frames. That's what's going on. Uh, oh, uh, oh, sorry. Yeah, I got it. I got it. I got it. Too many cooks in this kitchen. Uh, let me go to output. I'm going to drop my... F uh, I'm going to drop my um, streaming bit rate to 25 megabits. Everyone, you'll see a, a dropout. Yeah, because the audio is a separate stream. Okay, you should have seen the video cut out completely for a moment and then come back. Yeah, the audio, the audio and video streams are separate streams, so the video can cut out while the audio is fine. Um, but yeah, I just saw the drop frame counter go up, so. Too many cooks. Okay, all right, excellent. Thanks, everyone. Uh, so our drop frame count is at 724, so if any other glitches happen, I'll check that number and see if it's higher. All right. Okay, okay, okay. So, sorry, let me um, try and accelerate here. Doing many things at once. So IBM puts out the EGA card in 1984, and long story, <laughs> it takes a long time to explain, but in short, uh, the, the EGA card delivered new capabilities, massively better than anything else on, on the market, uh, anything else. Like in 84, to my knowledge, you could not purchase any computer of any stripe that could deliver better graphics and color than the... Um, the IBM EGA card for less than like $40,000. We're talking uh, really quite a leap forward. But the truth of the matter is that um, the CGA card was capable of most of the things that, the, that these new EGA enabled applications did. In theory, if you just increased the amount of video memory on the CGA, it could draw something that looks very much like Commander Keen. And uh, it didn't have hardware scrolling, which was an important thing that EGA added. I'll give it that. But it could have been bodged in fairly easily. Instead, what they delivered was a card that was... What the fuck? Did they lose internet? No, I'm getting text. What the fuck is going on here? Says excellent connection. There we go. I think it just came back. What the fuck is going on here? I, I have no idea what just happened. Why are we dropping frames? Uh, it's, it's, and we're back. Now it's time to go to a place where we can talk to God. Or the devil. Take a little trip down church lane. All right, I'm going to pump the bitrate down again just in case. Motherfucker. Don't need this. Don't need this. <sighs> I'm trying to tell a story about the goddamn EGA. All right. Are we good? Are we good? Are we good? Someone tell me if we're good. <laughs> low latency it is the upstairs chair as it turns out uh all right well anyway um assuming you can all 
yeah, it's hardware encoding. So I don't know what's up. Anyway, all right. Uh, but uh, just to, to long story short, so uh, basically, uh, oh, okay, so it cut off in the middle of that explanation. Terrific. All right. Well, anyway, yeah, so EGA was massively over enhanced over the CGA, unnecessarily so. And uh, long story short, what happened is, uh, <laughs> long story short, what happened is that IBM had already sold a million CGA monitors. IBM and other companies had sold a bunch of uh, CGA monitors uh, from 81 to 86. Those were the only things people had. Uh, they weren't going to be interested in uh, upgrading their monitors. And in order for the new capabilities of EGA to work, you needed a monitor that was dual sync because the original um, the original CGA card could only do 640 by 200 and 320 by 200. And the new EGA card supported a new 640 by 350 mode, which requires the monitor to actually change its timing, whereas the other one didn't. So the original CGA monitor only supported one frequency, 15 kilohertz, and the new EGA monitor had to support 15 and uh, 22 kilohertz. So, yeah, that too. The EGA was also not well designed. It was IBM past their like moment of clarity that brought the, the PC into existence in the first place. Uh, <laughs> so most of the new capabilities of EGA never got used. And as a result, nobody bought any monitors for it. There were no monitors, so they didn't use the new capabilities. They didn't use the new capabilities, so there were no, no new mo so nobody bought monitors, so nobody made monitors. So yeah, chicken and egg problem. So nobody nobody ended up buying EGA displays is what it seems like. Like from the fossil record and, and whatnot, it's easy to get the impression that nobody bought EGA displays, but in practice, there were many, many, many models. There were a lot of third-party displays that supported it. The trouble is they're really hard to recognize. It's tough to actually tell what can do it. For instance, this guy right here is an EGA monitor, but you'd hardly know it if you didn't know what to look for. It's not labeled as such, and there were tons of CGA monitors that looked exactly like this. And when you look on the back of it, we will get back to the micro VTech. Don't, don't worry. I just have to set this up first. So when we look at the back of this monitor, the signal input is a 9-pin plug, which is typically uh, CGA. Am I muted? I'm not muted, am I? Nope. Uh, it's a 9-pin plug, which is typically CGA, and if you plug a CGA in there, it'll work. So, yeah, it's it's real hard uh, <laughs> uh, to actually tell. And so the tubes are not necessarily different. It's the front end. It's all about the the front end. It's the uh, the 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 sync circuitry, the and the the tube control circuitry has to be able to sweep the image at two different frequencies. Well, eventually, what happened is like. So circuit 84, when they first started selling this, you needed a, what they called a dual sync monitor, which had circuitry for 15 kilohertz and different circuitry for 22 kilohertz. Well, by the time people started buying EGA cards, technology had advanced, and now they were able to make monitors that were multi-sync, which is what we are used to if you were using like VGA monitors in the 90s and 2000s. Uh, a multi-sync monitor is one that will accept any signal within a whole range of frequencies. That's why you can get one VGA display and set it to 640 by 480, 800 by 600, 1024 by 768, because it has circuitry that can adapt arbitrarily. Like, you could take those same monitors and feed them 800 by 500 and they would work. You could feed them 640 by 600 and they would work. As long as you gave it uh, frequencies that were within its horizontal and vertical range, those monitors would actually adapt to anything that you sent them, in theory. I don't know how often this was tested or if there were exceptions, but the notion is uh, that they should adapt to anything within a range. Both of these monitors are from uh, 88 and 90, so they're into the multi-sync era, which is exciting because it means that they'll work not only with CGA and EGA, and not, uh, not just with the enhanced colors that the EGA brought, but in the fully expanded, uh, high resolution, expanded palette mode. But this one in particular will work with a lot of other things. So 
EGA and CGA used TTL signaling, where they use logic levels to uh, communicate color to the monitor. So they've got, in CGA, you had a red, a green, and a blue pin, and they could be either on or off. And that's it, no in-between, in theory. So you could send the combinations of all three colors, so that's a total of eight colors, and then it had an extra pin called intensity, which just cut the uh, brightness of all of the colors in half. And that doubled your palette for a total of 16 colors. Every single video game you've played for a PC before the VGA era, most likely, was using that palette. Uh, Commander Keen, um, uh, Biomenace, um, all the stuff, the, you know, Jill of the Jungle, etc. All the stuff that, that, that predated VGA, there was almost nothing on CGA. Anything that looked like a video game on the PC was using that color palette up till like 1992, 93, when we really started to pitch over to, to VGA. So when they went to EGA, they added more color lines. They repurposed some of the pins in the connectors so that instead of just RGB and intensity, there were now uh, red and then red intensity, green and then green intensity, and blue and blue intensity. So you had six bits instead of four for your color information. Okay, well, then we come back to the BBC Micro, which also used TTL video, except it used three bit. So it only had uh, eight colors total, it had no intensity line, just red, green, blue, and their combinations. So we've now got th three different definitions for TTL monitor. And then there's another because over in Japan, NEC was making computers, the PC-8801 and 9801 series, and those also supported TTL video. And it was almost identical to the PC, it was RGBI, except two things. One, the PC ran at either 15 kilohertz or 22 kilohertz. The PC-88 and 98 ran at 24 kilohertz. You can not buy a 24 kilohertz monitor. They do not exist. No, they don't, no, no, not a thing. They were never made for any other purpose that I am aware of, just those two computers. And since those never became a thing here, unless you're very lucky and find an Epson that's still working, uh, you, if you want to use a PC-88 or 98, you are not going to find an LCD that syncs to it from what I've seen. And if you do, what's the fucking point? It's an LCD, get out of here, just emulate it at that point. Uh, you're going to have to import it from Japan. End of story. You're going to have to import it from Japan. It's going to cost you hundreds and hundreds of dollars and it will arrive destroyed if it even worked to begin with. So, the big, and even if, even if you manage to get a display that supports TTL, not analog video, but TT, oh yeah, you might have an LCD monitor that'll do, uh, that'll scan down to 15 kilohertz. NEC made a number of them. Dell, I think, made a number of them. They're very uh, coveted. You can't buy them anymore for this reason because people want to use them to plug in like uh, old game consoles and whatnot. None of them take TTL video. None of them. And you can convert it, but that, uh, the, 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 if you want an authentic experience, you are never going to find anything that scans down to 24 kilohertz and takes TTL except a monitor that was built for the PC-88 or PC-98. End of story, unless you know exactly what to look for in these guys, which can both do it. And so, as a result, <laughs> another nuance comes into play. The IBM PC used RGBI TTL video so did the NEC, except let's um do I have a way to demonstrate this? Let's plug some stuff in. I've got a computer here. Let me uh we'll go back to the micro VTech, I promise, but I need to show you the basics first before I can talk about uh the showstopper. One moment. We need to compute. We're not doing nearly enough computing. Sorry if you saw my ass. Oh. Yeah, so the NEC Multisync is one of the monitors that can do all the things that I want to do, and that's what this is. It says AT&T on it, but I found out from looking up the FCC ID that it's secretly a rebadged NEC Multisync. It's very funny. All right. Oh. We can be able to see this screen. There might be a bit too much room lighting. Let's see what happens. 
Oh, there we go. Oh, I didn't copy over hymem.sys. I should be killed for this. There we go. Okay. Yeah, the camera overlay is on purpose. I can turn it off, but everybody told me to leave it on. Yes. Yeah, uh, this monitor has visible burn-in even when it's off, but you'll pretty much never notice it unless you're uh, unless you're staring at like a solid color background. So let's do that. Uh, let's see, normal text, background, let's do, oh, intriguing. Oh, there we go. Ah, there it is. All right, let's get in there. Sorry. There we go. We got a little bit. We got a little bit of rolling uh, roll bar. Rolling. What's it called? Whatever. Anyway. Uh, this monitor, I don't think, has a degauss button. Um, yeah, this one does not have a degauss button. Uh, when you turn it on... It might degauss on its own. I'm not sure. Not sure. So anyway, this is a... Uh, <clears throat> sorry, I'm trying to keep up with chat. So I keep interrupting myself. Uh, so this is EGA. This is rock and roll. And let me show you something. So we've got... Ye so this is the palette, right? We got uh, white, yellow, pink, bright red. Yes, these are just as desaturated in real life. This monitor is kind of kind of desaturated. Cyan, green, blue, uh, a gray, uh, and then we have a darker gray, and then a brown, except, wait a minute, that's not brown. That's not very brown. It's more of a dark yellow, wouldn't you say? And we have magenta, red, dark cyan, green, blue, and black. So let's go back to brown here. I'm just gonna reach around the back of the display here for a second, no reason. And let me just find the thing. Oops. Rut row. Well, that's strange. I'm actually not getting the uh, I'm not getting the result that I expected here. That's that's intriguing. Hmm. What do I think of that? Huh. Odd things are afoot. I had tested this before, and I thought that the result I got was a little odd. I wonder if there are strange things going on with the card that I'm using here. Huh. Sorry, this is uh, kind of surprising. This result's kind of surprising to me. Wait a minute, is this on? Yeah, that's on. Uh, we're not in text mode, are we? No, we're not. Hmm. Okay. Well... Hmm, that's something to think about. I'm gonna to have to think about that before I make a video using this because I had not encountered this particular problem before. Okay, well, so let me um, go back and do what I, <laughs> here's what I was going to say. So when IBM designed their version of the TTL monitor, they decided that the, uh, the dark yellow color that would naturally result from picking uh, red and green and, um, no, I'm sorry, right? Oh my God, do red and green mix to make yellow? I can't remember. Please help. <laughs> I don't know basic colors right now. I'm really frazzled. Doesn't matter. When you pick yellow, if you apply the intensity bit, then you get a bright yellow. But if you don't apply the intensity bit, then you get a dark yellow, which just kind of looks like shit. And so what IBM did is they added special circuitry to... Okay, thank you. Uh, they added special circuitry to their monitor so that when it detects that specific combination, uh, it adds a little bit of red, which instead of producing a dark yellow, instead produces a brown, which is a lot more useful. So technically, the IBM RGBI palette is not accurate. Uh, and tons of software was developed that made this assumption. <sighs> thank you, uh, guy. Uh, and... Then when all those EGA games came out, like Commander Keen, they used that dark yellow for the ground, for dirt, right? So it needed to be brown. 
But on the PC-8898, it wasn't brown. It was dark yellow. So this monitor, theoretically, I'm not sure what's going on here, uh, but this monitor, theoretically, has a uh, selection on the back that lets you pick whether to use the IBM or the NEC interpretation of those colors. That's what the manual says. Why it's not doing it, why it's ending up salmon, um, I'm not sure. I need to give that some thought. What is causing that? I have no idea. I'm gonna have to discuss this with some people. Um, well, you know what? Uh, okay, here's, um, there we go. Here's a great opportunity to leverage our second EGA display. Now, uh, because we're only dealing with the, EG, with the original CGA palette right now, I actually have another monitor. I have a Tandy monitor th uh, that we could use uh, that I know is accurate and has no weirdness going on. Saw brown on the dark yellow for a second. Yeah, I wonder if the switch is like hinky. Oh, and that's the other thing is I'm not using a real IBM EGA card because they are rare as hen's teeth, these things. Nobody has one. Uh, I suspect nobody bought one at all because they were so goddamn expensive. So instead, um, I'm using a thing called a Twin Head, which is uh, just some unknown Taiwanese company that was making graphics cards for a bit. I can't remember who made the chipset on it. Uh, I think it might be a Chips and Technologies. So yeah, there could be quirks in the implementation of the EGA controller. And I guess we're going to find out in a moment here because this TV, as I recall, I'm fairly certain, yeah, this one is meant to plug into an IBM display specifically. So this should have the brown. Set that to TTL. Uh, let's make sure it's not on auto. Yes, it is. So let's give the same picture to this guy. Let's see what happens. That's the wrong button. That's why we... What kind of bastard would press that button? Real asshole button to press there. All right, this is the Micro VTech definition. This one does degauss itself on startup. And would you look at that? That's the right color. That is the correct color. Whoa, oh, right. When this, this thing is having some, a uh, little bit of uh, old component difficulties, so you have to turn down the brightness a little bit on startup until everything warms up. Uh, I don't love that, but. It'll calm down after a bit. But at any rate, yeah, there's, there's the color. That's what it should be. Okay, so Helga, uh, I uh, described this earlier, but I assume you were not here. So uh, it is it is TTL. It's digital. It's not analog at all. So it sends red, green, and blue as on-off values, uh, and then there's a intensity value, which uh, just halves the brightness of the combined color. So a total sixteen possible colors, and then the enhanced EGA modes, which I'll show you shortly here. Uh, the enhanced EGA modes use two bits for each color. So a uh, higher and a lower bit for red, green, and blue. All digital. So theoretically, um, uh, theoretically, uh, uh, you're limited to 64 possible colors. Oh, good news. Everything is uh, warmed up, so now it's not doing the thing anymore. Terrific. So this is why if you buy an original IBM VGA display from 1987, even though the original VGA card was limited to 256 colors, you can plug it into a modern display and get 16 million colors out of it. But uh, with these displays, they're limited by their hardware implementation. Like the, uh, yeah, th these displays can only ever display 16 colors in CGA mode or 64 colors in EGA mode. So. As you can see, the rest of the colors are exactly the same. So we got our, oops, we got our white, our yellow, pink, bright red is kind of salmon-y, but definitely uh, close enough. Uh, cyan, green, these all look correct. Uh, and yes, white is not actually supposed to be white because they consider that bright white. Don't know what that was all about. Um, and then yeah, brown, brown is uh, 
brown because the, it's got the, the special I, I, uh, IBM circuitry. Okay, so what is Super VGA? So, in short, let me give you a little bit of history here. Uh, when CGA came out, the original CGA card was very, very, very basic. It had no intelligence, really. It was basically an off-the-shelf Motorola MC6845 CRT controller chip uh, that's on uh, lots and lots of home computers from the era, among other things. And you're more or less just programming the registers directly. It's got a little bit of, of self-containedness, uh, but that's about it. The EGA card is a bit more advanced, and then the VGA card is far more advanced. But when these cards came out, they defined very, very limited uh, interfaces. Like the interface with the, 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 the system, with software, is uh, very, very bare bones. And nothing stops you from just talking to the card directly. So you could ask the original CGA card to do things that were impossible. You could ask it to uh, pretend that it's got 64 or 128K of memory and that it would just produce gibberish results. But you could do it and you could do the same with the EGA and, and with VGA. They supported uh, all kinds because it's just a, a generic off the shelf chip. You can, tell to, you, know, you can tell to do many things that IBM didn't intend. And they would just tell you in the manual, don't do that. So what this did is it uh, sparked off a whole market of third-party cards which did enable those things. So the original CGA card only had 64K of memory and that limited it to only uh, 16 colors in text mode at 80 by 25 characters or uh, to only four colors in the bitmap graphics modes. But if you just give it more RAM and then treat it otherwise exactly the same, you can expand the capabilities of those modes. So all the way back in like 82, 83, there were super CGA cards. And that was a not a meaningful term per se. It didn't tell you what the card could do. You had to read the manual to understand exactly what it was capable of. But generally speaking, it meant a CGA card with more RAM. And then EGA came out and the same thing happened. There were super EGA cards. That's what I have in here. Uh, it's register wise, it is bit, you know, interface compatible, ABI compatible, if you will, with uh, the uh, IBM EGA card. It behaves exactly the same, except you can also ask it to do other things that the EGA card wouldn't do. Uh, and it has certain capabilities, like the ability to convert between, to internally convert between certain video modes. And then you got wild stuff like the ATI EGA Wonder, uh, which would do things like you could plug a VGA monitor in and then tell the card to appear to the system as EGA, and it would do that, and then just convert it internally to work on that monitor. Or you could send the card VGA with an EGA monitor connected and it would convert it the other way. Or you could plug in an MDA monitor and it would convert CGA to MDA and all these other things. They sold it as, what was it? If you run any program on any monitor at any time was I think their tagline for it. So then VGA comes out and officially the VGA card was capable of the CGA modes, the EGA modes, all very firm and fixed. A set of colors from a palette and a resolution and a timing. And then the VGA modes, uh, likewise, completely fixed. The original VGA card could do uh, 640 by 480, and then it could do all the previous modes, and it had specifications for how many colors you'd have in each mode. And then Super VGA cards came out, and it was the exact same thing again. It was VGA, except they'd given it more memory and a better RAM DAC. And so now instead of just 640 by 480, you could run it to 800 by 600. And if you had a multi-sync monitor, it would just pick it right up, right? Now with all of these, they didn't work with normal software. You had to write customs, you had to write software that was customized to those particular cards. Uh, in fact, I can show you an example of this. Got it on here. Oh, right. It's EGA GAMS. Where did I put it? There we go. Sorry, I know you can't see the screen. I'm just, uh, oh, whoops. Uh, I've made an error. Please hold. There we go. So, this is Flight Simulator, Microsoft Flight Simulator 4. Let's see if this has what I'm looking for. Uh, yes, we have a 386. 
Okay, here we go. So, uh, no, this doesn't have any of the really custom modes I was looking for, unfortunately. These are all pretty um, off-the-shelf things. Uh, we do have the, the Tandy card. And the Tandy card was more or less, well, really the Tandy card. Oh, you know what? I just remembered. Uh, give me a sec. I do have it. I have it on here. I just I just got a floppy image ready before I started this. Sorry. I've had a kind of a day. It's been kind of, kind of frazzled today. Uh, but, 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 this supports all these different modes. So let's do CGA mode on an RGB monitor, which would be that one right there. All right, here we go. Let me um, chill this down a little bit. Okay. Uh, the, the Stride with Pride shirt is like a pink washing uh, campaign shirt from some pet food company I've never heard of, but I couldn't find any information suggesting that they were actually uh, <laughs> actually uh, uh, insincere about it. So uh, anyway, so all right, so this is Microsoft Flight Simulator in CGA mode. So what we have here are let me turn it down a little bit more even. We've got we've got per pixel graphics, but they're in a total of four colors. Cyan, magenta, white, and black. And we're absolutely stuck with this. Now, as you can see, whoops. As you can see, this is updating at uh, quite a nice clip. This is a good, what, 30 FPS, maybe even faster. Looks absolutely fantastic. I love Flight Simulator. It has such crisp graphics in all of its modes and it supports all of them, let me tell you. Let me, uh, let me adjust the camera here, just a second. Come on, buddy. Eh, too far. Oh, we're gonna crash. Oh no. God, it's hard to photograph CRTs. It's so difficult. Plus, I probably need to wipe the screen off on this one, but. <laughs> anyway, so this looks great. And this is how uh, this would have looked, uh, albeit at a lower frame rate, on a contemporary original CGA monitor. So you can plug this into a 1981 IBM PC monitor and it will look just like this. Okay. So now, let's quit. I want to go again. All right, so this time we're gonna pick, uh, let's go for a EGA 16 color. Now we're gonna pick option G here. This is the same resolution, 320 by 200, and this would work on the exact same monitor. This is running really well because it's running on a Pentium 133. Turns out you can put a, uh, you put an EGA card in a Pentium uh, machine from like 1986 and it's uh, it's happy, it doesn't mind. All right, so technically this is the same resolution. It's using the same color depth. It's just RGBDI TTL. So we've got red, green, blue, and intensity and that's it. But obviously we've got a lot more, uh, a lot lusher video on the screen. Oh, I didn't quite get my throttle all the way up. Oh boy, oh boy, oh boy. Michael Crichton's airframe is playing out right now. We're porpoising. Uh, there we go. <laughs> so I can plug this into my Tandy monitor from... Uh, oh, oh shit, the yoke didn't self-center. I can plug, the, plug this into my Tandy monitor or into an IBM CGA monitor from 1981 on this exact same card, and it would work perfectly because it's still only 200 lines. So this is a 15 kilohertz signal. In other words, uh, 240p for all, for all intents and purposes. And it's actually a little bit compressed, really. Um, there is a, uh, an adjustment on here, so you can adjust the vertical height. It's probably actually supposed to be stretched a little bit vertically, but uh, we don't mind. And I, abs I, I absolutely love the way that this looks in this mode as well. Every I made a little webpage on my site where I compare, I had uh, screenshots comparing all the different video modes of uh, Flight Simulator 4 because I think they're all so beautiful. Like, it's, it's the same thing viewed through many different lenses, but everyone just just looks terrific. Okay, so now, let's bail. Oops, that was the wrong button. No, we don't want demo mode, we want leave mode. There we go. All right, 
I want to go again. Okay. All right. So now what we're going to do, we're going to pick H. Put it in H, which is the EGA enhanced mode. Watch, watch closely when I do this. I'm going to zoom out a little bit. And let's get a little more brightness here. Everyone watch the raster closely. And... Oh, wow, it actually did a really slick job. You couldn't see it, but it just changed uh, scan rates. Now, instead of scanning at 15 kilohertz, it's scanning at 22. Most likely, it's possible the card did the conversion because this is a super EGA card. I can't be 100% sure. But at any rate, this is the same color depth. It's only, um, uh, or sorry, is that true? Let me think for a second. Well, okay, from the game's perspective, this is the same color depth because... You can only have 16 colors on the screen at one time with EGA. However, they're being chosen from a larger palette. This is kind of hard to see because, well, pretty much all these colors were already good the way they were. And also, a little secret for you, the expanded color palette on the EGA sucks. It's not very good. It doesn't give you a lot of... Uh, it doesn't give you a lot of useful colors. Same problem with the NES. The NES has a 64 color palette, if I remember correctly, but most of the colors are fucking useless. Uh, so uh, the only real difference that I can see here is I'm that is orange, and the base uh, CGA palette does not contain an orange. And you know what? It looks really good. It's a little tiny enhancement, but it does look good. Also, I think that's a different shade of blue. Because I, I don't think the dark blue would look that way. Um... The blue-green gauges, um, maybe. I'm not sure. And the red might be more intense. But the more important thing is, you'll notice the image is a little bit taller. I wish I was a baller. I wish it, yeah. Uh, and that's because we're now running at 640 by 350. So it's, uh, there's more pixels on the screen. So for the same, um, for the same, uh, 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 gosh. For the same geometry config. Uh, LCD CGA. That's a good question. I'm not... Oh, right, right, right. Shades of Grey. Yes, because at the time that this game came out, uh, there were lots of laptops that had CGA support, but they were going into a, a, an LCD display that couldn't do uh, any color. That is correct. So, yeah, we just did uh, two completely different modes on the same card. This was wild shit in 1984. Nothing else did this. Every single computer... Uh, had the exact same resolution for years. And then suddenly, bam. Uh, let's take a look at what the LCD mode looks like. I know we're curious about that. Yep. So there it is. And you can see... Oh, sorry. Let me turn off uh, focus peaking. There we go. Sorry. I just realized focus peaking was on. So every... Ah, shit. That's why the red was easier to read. The camera was actually adding that. Uh, my bad. But anyway, as you can see, this is now grayscale with uh, dithering. So not even, um, uh, not even actually uh, uh, shades of gray. It's just dithered. It does a really good job of it though, because uh, I think we're running at well, this is three twenty by two hundred, right? You know, huh? Wonder if the card is doing any, or would this be six? Is this oh, this might be the six forty by two hundred mode. Now that I think about it, possibly. Not sure. Oh, wow. Look how chunky the buildings are, though. Look at that guy. Chunky monkey. That is cool. What happens? Let's, uh... Oh, that's neat. That's neat. Honk. Okay. So, uh... In these early days, in order to, uh... In order to expand the resolution or the color depth of your display, your only option was to get a new display. There was no other way to do it. Uh, nobody was making multi-sync back in 84, but by the time these monitors came out, multi-sync was all over the place. So these are both quite capable. They'll display any image from 15 kilohertz all the way up to 36 kilohertz, which is quite a bit. Um, VGA is 31.5 kilohertz. So we're talking um, 800 by 600 at 56 hertz is what this will display. It won't quite go to 60, but the dot pitch isn't high enough for you to make that out anyway. So uh, these these will do 800 by 600 in, in TTL. 
They don't care what the color format is. If you happen to have a device that, that outputs that, conceit, you know, you know what would be fun now that I think about it? Oh man, I hadn't thought about that. I could, um, I could make like a, a, a microcontroller program, like an Arduino program uh, that, uh, that drives these things. It'd be pretty easy. Because uh, it's all just logic levels. I wouldn't need a DAC. That'd be fun. That would be fun. Never thought about that. All right. So let's talk about the capabilities on the Micro VTech. So I've shown you, you know, that it works, but what's so special about it, right? Let's take a look at the back. Well, actually, let's take a look at the whole thing first off, because here's uh, the coolest thing about it. What you are looking at is not plastic. And I need you to understand me when I say, that's steel, that's steel, that's steel, that's steel, 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 everywhere. There is no plastic on this entire unit. The entire thing is made of heavy gauge steel sheet metal. It is... <laughs> brick shit house right here okay real shit house hours that you could use this thing as a tank chalk all right this this goddamn monitor cannot be destroyed by any force of god or man uh to wit it still works perfectly uh <laughs> and being that micro vtech didn't fuck around with their build quality uh oh i'm sorry this is a 12 inch display and it weighs 40 pounds <laughs> Um, sorry, I read in chat. I, yeah, I think if you put this on a train track, <laughs> train, <laughs> uh, all right. So what we got here, it's not all that exciting, um, uh, per se, cause all the magic is inside, but so we've got RG and B inputs, uh, and apparently ripple through. It's odd that they aren't labeled as such, but they seem to be. Um, so you can put raw uh, RGB in here. You'll notice there's no sync. Now it can do sync on green uh, and it can do composite and HV sync. So every sync format that exists. The trouble is if you want those, you got to put them in here. So you've got to build some funky cable that plugs in here and here. Yeah, yeah, what can you do? Um, and then, uh, pardon me, this switch here flips you between analog and TTL. So that's the really cool thing about this monitor. This one can do all that stuff I was talking about in analog as well. So yes, it'll do TTL. Uh, uh, you can you can do TTL from a CGA card, an EGA card in either mode, a BBC micro with its weird format or a cord electrons, same thing, but different. Uh, the PC88, the PC98. And then, oh, I'm sorry. I left out the uh, Commodore 128 which also used RGBI. Maybe I'll fire that up here uh, if I have time. And then you can just wheel across town and plug it into uh, any 15 kilohertz RGB device, Sony MSX, a modded SNES, you name it. Or you can use it as a VGA display on an IBM PC or anything else that outputs VGA. Uh, the sky's the limit. Basically any video signal that is not uh, greater than 800 by 600, this thing will eat. You might have to build a weird cable for it, but it'll do anything under the sun. Uh, in addition, however, as I mentioned earlier, uh, oh, did the Coco? Really, the Coco had RGBI. I didn't know that. I think, I have a Coco, but I think it's a two. Yes, I can see the number. It's a two. Bummer. Maybe I should get a three, because Coco cool. Yeah, I'm, so that's the thing, right? I'm sorry that we bought them all. The trouble is, um, me and my friends do all have very legitimate needs for them. We all mess around with like weird old 8-bit uh, computers from Japan and um, uh, uh, the UK and whatnot. And so uh, it's not like we're buying them just to like stick in the closet. You know, we can use them as much as anybody else. Uh, so we decided to go for it. Um, but also... These particular ones turned out to have a very interesting history. So, <clears throat> oh, does oh that's right. Did the ZX Spect the ZX Spectrum did add uh, a RGB in the plus two version? I think because Amstrad started producing them and they were doing it. I think because I've got one of those. I've got both of those actually. Um, so yeah, I could also hook up an Amstrad CPC. So. The sky's the limit. Anyway, 
Exactly, Ruby. That, that's the thing, right? I'm not putting this on a shelf and, and uh, so that I can take pictures of it to post to fucking Reddit, all right? I'm going to use the shit out of this. And I, I know that my weird friends are gonna use the shit out of theirs. So I don't feel too bad about it, although I am sorry that there aren't more. However, we think we know why there aren't more. This was a limited run special display made for a contract, and we know what the contract is. We think, we're pretty sure. Um, okay, I see, 128K toast rack. Oh, right, right, that makes sense. Uh, <clears throat> pardon me, Link, collect my thoughts. So, all right. This computer came to me in a box labeled Micronosis, as in like Gnosis, like Cygnosis. And we looked that up, and we also looked up some info about uh, Micro VTech um, in regards to this particular model. It's got a long name. Um, and what we pieced together is it seems that back in about 1989, 1990, this company, Micronosis, which was based out of, I think, Danbury, Connecticut, uh, was doing, they were selling trading floors. In other words, they would go to a company that was involved in stonks, uh, and they would say, hey, you want to build a stock trading floor into your building. We will do that for you. We're, so they're like a value-added reseller slash MSP slash integrator, right? So the computers, the displays, the seating, I assume, all at once. So they went to JP Morgan and they sold them on an 800-seat trading floor for their building at 60 um, uh, Wall Street. And we don't know, we don't 100% know that these were commissioned for this exact purpose, but it seems likely because there is a press release from Micro VTech where they say, if, if I remember correctly, that they did make a custom run of monitors for JP Morgan Bank. So putting the pieces together, it seems likely that Micronosis went to Micro VTech and ordered a short run of specially modified monitors uh, for stonks. These are, these are literally, yeah, these are for broker kiosks or the, the overhead you know, displays or they would have sat at people's desks. We don't know. We have no more information than that. But the reason that they're so fucking durable is partly because that's just how Micro VTech was, but also because they were going into a, a absolutely critical environment, right, where you know they'd get sued and erased from the earth if these failed. So they have to have incredibly robust circuitry built with the best parts. Everything inside is hot glued so that you know vibration can't affect it. Um, and they have all these inputs because who knows what they're gonna need to add to the system, right? They don't wanna sell them these monitors and then whoops, a year later they upgrade to IBM PS2s instead of uh, uh, EGA-based systems and um, suddenly they can't use them. But in addition, we learned that, and I don't know that this is unique to this product, but based on the manual, it seems like it is. This supports differential analog input, which I've never heard of. You can feed this thing balanced analog video, push-pull, so that it's completely noise resistant. Who the fuck does that? That's a thing? And I actually think that possibly that's what the two sets of BNCs might be for. I didn't finish reading the, that part of the manual uh, closely enough. But uh, yeah, differential signaling. So you, I guess, wouldn't get crosstalk, you know, blah. <laughs> so I'm wondering if that's what this is for. You put your push there and your pull there. Maybe, I'm not sure. So, yeah, just, um, hoo-hoo. <laughs> well, I mean, hot, you want hot glue because silicone, I don't think, was, you know, fully in at that point the way that it is now. But you want to have something, some kind of glop on your parts to keep them from moving around. And they're not glued down at the board. They're glued up the top of the components, which is where you want it. It makes uh, repair a lot easier. So, <laughs> thank you, Detox. Uh, so anyway, I spent $200 on this. Uh, my friend linked it to me. I shit my pants, wiped, uh, and then went and hit buy it now. And uh, it was $100 because the seller had no idea what they had. We think that they were sitting in their warehouse for like 14 years. So these could have gone in the dumpster at any second, okay? Um, the, that buyer must have like, they come back from lunch and there's 18 purchase orders sitting in eBay and they're just like, what the? It <laughs> must have been unreal. But, uh, uh, oh, Ben, you're probably right, because if it's differential signaling, oh, duh, right, the return is going to be on the shield. L leave me alone. Leave me alone. Um, 
Uh, Peter, I don't know. The manual was not clear, but it would, theoretically. Uh, well, we're... So they weren't new old stock because they had burn-in. However, mine didn't. Mine looks pristine, like it was never used. On the other hand, there's screw holes up here that aren't populated, so I thought that was interesting. Oh, no, I'm sorry. Those are mounting holes. I just realized those don't hold the case together, so never mind that. I didn't really see any dirt on it or anything. And they were all in the boxes with the original, like, um, not shrink wrap, but the, like, plastic bag and the foam. Uh, and the plague was taped shut, and it was definitely all original. But there was no manual, and they clearly had been out of the box. So what I'm thinking is that these were probably spares that were... because So this was an 800-seat trading floor. Well, I don't know what that looks like. Does that mean 800 desks and each one gets two of these? Or 800 desks and there's an array overhead? Or each desk gets one? And then how many spares did they produce? Etc. So we don't know if they made 800 of these or 1,600 or if they made 5,000 for spares um, or what. So it's probably less than 10,000, which is an incredibly small run for any mass produced, any, any product really. Um, it does make you wonder how these made it to, uh, you know, somebody's warehouse somewhere. What happened to the rest? Surely they didn't sell. When they got rid of these, no one in existence, no one in the world was interested in them. So, um, it's possible that they set this thing up in 1990. Three years later, JP Morgan goes, fuck this. Computers just massively, you know, leapt ahead. Let's replace all this. Pulled it all out of service and these barely got used. Or that this was a spare. And when they finally retired that trading floor in 1998, this one had just been put in a week earlier. So it had just enough time to get a drink spilled on it. Uh, and then they pulled it out of service. But either way, uh, it is a very weird little bite of history. No pun intended. Um, and, uh, yeah, as far as Trek, as far as I know, we've got the only ones that exist. Um, the rest could be in a landfill. I have no reason not to think so. So I got incredibly lucky, incredibly lucky. And, uh, okay. Frame by frame. I see what you're saying. Yeah. And I've, I've seen pictures of like trading floors, but it's also chaotic. I don't know what to think of it. I don't, you know, it's all just gibberish to me, but I would not be surprised, yes, if there's multiple screens per, per trader, but I don't know if these were necessarily for the desks or if they went overhead. I don't know. But the point is, we have a good idea what they were used for and why they are so strange and why they are so capable, although part of it just has to do with micro VTech being badasses. Uh, just make really good, really good products, um, even when they don't need to. So anyway, pressing on a little bit. Uh, so... It is a little on the small side. That is a 12 inch display. This one here is a 14, I believe. That's okay though, because back in the day, these were pretty reasonable sizes for computer monitors. Uh, the original IBM PC displays were all 12, I think. Um, and if you plopped this on top of an IBM PC, I think you'd be happy with it. And the other thing is with two of these in much smaller cases than the original PC used, you uh, might have been able to put two of them side by side uh, fairly reasonably, and there were reasons to do that. So uh, that's exciting. Now, for my purposes, what's exciting? Well, one, I didn't have an EGA display. I had a CGA display, and it was a good one, bigger than this, too. Uh, but I didn't have an EGA display. Now I do. But in addition, it's switchable. So... As per the uh, legend back here, we've got this little dip switch, slide switch here, and it lets you manually select between 3-bit, 4-bit, 6-bit, uh, and automatic uh, color format selection. So the automatic bit, who oh boy. <laughs> um, wait, there's one on eBay? One of which? Oh, I guess you probably can't link that, can you? <laughs> Oh, yeah, and that's the other thing, right? Is this, well, this would go up to, um, my friend f fed 576 interlaced video into it from, uh, so PAL, right? Um, from, I think, the BBC Micro, because I think it would do full resolution. So um, that's up there. Theoretically, it'll do 600 lines, but yeah, I don't think the dot pitch is amazing at that point. Um, <laughs> well, I'm glad to hear that frame buffer. <laughs> CM120MV, all right, bear with me. Um, oh, I'm alt-tabbing on the wrong keyboard. 
Uh, give me a sec. Uh, CM120 MV. CM120 MV. Let me look up what that is and see if it's uh, at all similar. Okay, well, I think that... All right. I think that's one of the... Um, oh, that's the one that's listed as pre, uh, pre-Commodore. Pre-Cub. Right. Oh, wow. Yeah, that's in uh, very much the same kind... Gosh, that's like... That's the exact same chassis. And that does... Hey, both TTL and analog. Um, it's only 240, but it'll do 50 or 60. Oh, that's the other thing. This will do both um, 50 and 60 hertz. You can feed uh, NTSC or PAL video into it. So, woohoo. That is, um, that's pretty cool. Although it does look, hmm. Oh, no, it says 15.625 kilohertz on the back. So I think that's fixed fre uh, uh, frequency. Still pretty cool. It's still... <laughs> Still a shit brick house. Uh, okay, anyway. Uh, so, uh, why do I want these? Right, right, right. So the switch is important because A, it lets me demonstrate some things about the differences between TTL color. But also, I'm an EGA truther, you see. So, this has, like I said, you can manually select which bit depth it uses, or it says auto. How does auto work? Well, we just saw auto work earlier. It correctly detected the uh, the color depth when it went to uh, uh, when flight simulator went to three fifty line mode. Well, the way that this works is stupid. So when EGA came out, IBM wanted to let the CGA monitors work with it, and they wanted to let the EGA, the new EGA monitors, work with the old CGA cards. So there had to be a way. Uh, they they had they had to have backwards and forwards compatibility problem is we didn't have anything like e did in those days so there was no way for the monitor to tell the computer uh which type it was or for the computer to tell the monitor which color depth that it wanted uh in fact there was no way to communicate any of that information because the cga interface had been designed for a fixed frequency product it was always 15 point whatever kilohertz so there was no need to include any of that stuff and there just weren't enough pins to put extra signaling bits on there when they got to vga that's one of the things they did vga doesn't actually need more pins than us uh, CGA because it's just RGB, HV, uh, and then you know power and ground. You could absolutely, and there are things that do this. You could absolutely put VGA through a, a nine-pin connector, but they went to the fifteen-pin partly because it allowed them to put identifier pins in there, so that the monitor could signal by bridging certain pins which type of monitor it was, and thus tell the card what type of video to output. If I remember this correctly, I believe that's how it worked. Eventually, this evolved into EDID, where it actually sent data over those pins. But originally, it was just a series of bits that told the, the card what to output. But there was no room for that in CGA, because they, they hadn't provided for pins on the connector for it. And also, this was not a point when... This was not a point in time when it was a reasonable thing to just put a microcontroller into a peripheral to have it tell the computer a couple bits of information. So, what IBM did instead... The... EGA multi, uh, sorry, the EGA dual sync monitor that they produced detects which resolution it, it, it's being sent by the polarity of the vertical, I think, sync signal. I can never quite remember this. So if the, if the, if the card is outputting 200 lines, it sends a positive polarity sync burst. If it's outputting 350 lines, it sends a negative polarity sync burst. And the monitor just has dumb circuitry that chooses a scan rate based on that. And the fucking color mode. Because they didn't have room. They had nowhere else to provide another bit of information to tell the monitor whether it should be the 64 color palette using 6 bits for the TTL color or the old 4 bit palette. So instead, they just went, well, if it's an EGA enhanced program, it'll be running in the 350 line mode. They smashed the two bits of information together when, into one. And as a result, there is officially no way to tell, there's no way to tell an EGA monitor to run in 200 line resolution, but use the 64 color palette. Well, 640 by 350 is way too many fucking pixels for, I, I, I literally, I wrote hundreds of words about this problem. In short, nobody was going to do this. Nobody was going to write games that ran at the new EGA resolution. They might have used the new palette if it were available to them, but 640 by 350 was just too fucking many pixels for an 8088 to push. And even by 86, when EGA started catching on, people were still heavily using original IBM XTs. 286s and 386s pretty much got ignored by the majority of people until the 90s. So, as a result, 
when Commander Keen came out in 1990, I think, 91, 90, when Commander Keen came out, it came out for VGA cards, which had far better capabilities, but they wanted EGA backwards compatibility, so they wrote the entire game in 19 fucking 90 to only use the original CGA 16 color palette because the game had to be 320 by 200 in order to run on those cards and there was no way to do that with the expanded palette. Now I did say the expanded palette sucks and it does suck, but the game could have looked just a little bit better, a little bit lusher, a little bit subtler if they had had access to that palette and it would have been so easy to do except that IVM formally made it impossible to do. And it wasn't. You, you could tell the EGA card to do this, but the monitor wouldn't know that you were doing it. The only option, the only solution to make this possible was to have a switch on the monitor that lets you override the interpreted color. And what they could have done, game developers could have said, hey, the new thing for games is that, sure, you've got those EGA cards, well, you've got to buy an EGA monitor. And if you do, then you can just flip that switch to 64 color mode and then tell the game that you've done that, which was not a huge lift. Well, I mean, for instance, you just saw it. Microsoft Flight Simulator asked me, what, six questions on startup? You get this fucking interrogation every time you start it. What type of mouse do you have? What type of keyboard do you have? Your function keys on the top or on the side? Do you have this card? Do you have that card? What type of monitor do you have? If you answer any of this wrong, your computer blows up, basically. Like, you just get, you know, garbage on the screen, and you have to reboot in order to, you know, proceed, right? This was completely par for the course. They reasonably could have asked people to enter this information, and we could have had slightly better, slightly better graphics in games, but they didn't. And it's understandable, I get it, but I would still like people to know that it could have been possible. So, uh, there were a couple games that did this, just a couple, and we're gonna see if we can fire one up here. Um, I haven't tested these yet. I tested another one, I tested Rambo 3, Rambo 3, um, which is supposed to support this, but it only supports it on special monitors, you, or sorry, special cards. You have to have a Paradise EGA card uh, one of those super CGA types. Uh, that's that Hawaiian burger joint. Um, and I don't have one. And I had hoped that it would work with other super CGAs, but apparently it doesn't. So, no dice there. Let me uh, get some power here. Oops. Sorry for the noise, folks. Where the fuck did my power cable go? Oh. I'll be right back. You know what? I gotta hit the head. I'll be right back.
All right. So, let's get fuckest here. Welcome back to the stage of history. Oh, by the way, I saw a few people commenting on the music. That is by Zircon, uh, who I originally became aware of um, due to, I think, uh, his overclocked remix work, I believe. Um, and it turns out that he licenses his entire body of work for unlimited use, royalty-free, um, for $90. And that was absolutely worth it. So, <clears throat> I was really sick of the really short um, songs I had on there before. But yeah, Zircon absolutely bangs. All right, so um, this is a game by Bitmap Brothers called Gods. It's one of the extremely few titles that does the thing that I'm about to demonstrate here. I need to read the manual for this and make sure that I'm not just being bamboozled, but people say it does, and it sure looks like it does. So what we have here is simple EGA. Um, let me say this right. So this is, this, is, this is 320 by 200. This is the CGA mode that uses the original CGA palette only on a normal EGA card, uh, and that is what we're seeing. But, let me just get around behind the gadget here. Y'all ready for this? Motherfucking bonk. Okay, now, I don't know how clear it is, but pay close attention. It looks just a little bit less good. Whoops, switch a little dirty. Uh, but if you pay attention to like the background, like the helmet back there, Looks a little crunchy here. Looks a little better there. The black becomes kind of a dark orange. And supposedly, supposedly this is the thing. So you can see the, the sort of the shadows of the guy's legs look a little bit better there than they do here. And the bricks in the background look a little bit softer. Let's um, let's see if we can get in closer. You know, let's um, let's go ahead and start the game. That'll probably make this a little bit easier. <laughs> you know, it's really not rendering as well on camera as it is in real life. I'm really honestly astonished. Let me fuck with this a little bit. Close that, but you're way down. Man, I'm just, I'm looking at how it's rendering on the screen and oh, it just doesn't. CRTs, baby. It just, you can't, you gotta look at them. You can't. It just does not compare to the real thing. Like, it's just so much more vibrant in real life. This is wild. <sighs> yeah, bitmapbrothers.jpg. Okay, well, you know what? Let's get spicy and switch displays. Let's see if the other one... Let's see if the other one does a better job. Sorry, Cass, I was saying this is CGA resolution and using the 16 color RGBI palette that the original CGA was limited to, even though it couldn't display all 16 of those colors at once, it's still the original, it's referred to notionally as the CGA palette because that's what the card had access to while the uh, EGA theoretically had a larger palette. But I agree that it's confusing terminology. I'm just not exactly sure what else to do. I have not found a better alternative. Um, it's funny because between me and friends, at this point when we're talking about it, we just use 3-bit, 4-bit, and 6-bit uh, uh, <laughs> um, because you know we know the terminology. It's, it's, it's natural to us at this point because we've been talking about it so much. Uh, but you can't. You can't just impose that on people. You can't go, oh yeah, it's 3-bit TTL. Like, even if you've just heard the explanation, that's not going to fly. That's not going to stick. <laughs> I, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't ask somebody to, to try and keep track of that shit. I'll probably do it anyway when I, when I make the video, but that's a different thing. 
Okay. So both of these monitors have an auto mode. Oh, and I forgot to mention that. Shit. So both these monitors have an auto option on the back. They've got the color mode override switch, but then they also have an auto option. And that uses the IBM algorithm, right? If the sync pulse is positive, it's uh, three bit, or sorry, four bit color. If it's negative, then it's six bit color. And that of course also means that they assume the resolution based on that. Well, you noticed, or maybe, maybe you did, maybe you didn't. On this monitor, when I flipped that switch, it changed size because when I took it off auto, because auto was sizing the screen based on the the sync pulse direction, which was 320 by 200. But when I flipped it to 64 color mode, it goes, oh, 64 colors, you must be using EGA enhanced. And it automatically shrunk the screen so that the larger, longer raster would fit. This is desired behavior if you're not trying to use a game that's doing this hacky, unofficial mode shit, right? This monitor here, I didn't tell you where this came from yet. So this I paid $200 for on eBay, $100 and then $100 shipping. That was a steal, a steal on top of a steal because normally in order to get these capabilities, uh, you'd have to get an NEC multi-sync monitor which are over $450 and mostly broken and look like shit. So I was happy to pay this. I, I was making out like a thief no matter what. The next day I walk into RePC and on the kill palette is this thing because it's got burn-in and nobody will buy a, a monitor with burn-in. People just won't do it. Me, you know, I would, yeah, but you're not there. This is the way, that's the way it plays out. Like, yes, there is somebody somewhere, they have no way to get with that person and they cannot warehouse this stuff until that person wanders in if they ever do. So monitor comes with burn in, just goes on the pallet because you can't sell it. Nobody will buy it. Well, I'm not anybody, I'm not people. So I bought it, 20 bucks. So I wait five years to find a fucking EGA monitor. I never find a single one, none, anywhere, switchable or otherwise. Uh, I'd heard legends about them. I'd never seen a picture. I'd never seen a description, a demonstration, nothing. I find two in two days for a total of like 230 bucks. Like, God damn it, my luck. And this one turns out to have something that this one doesn't. This monitor lets you override the color without making assumptions about the resolution, which is exactly what I want. That's what I wanted in the first place. So technically, as much as I love this thing, it's not even satisfactory for my needs. It doesn't actually do what I need it to do. What a kick in the dick. All right, so. Uh, uh, this monitor needs some help, I think, because, mm, let's. So for one thing, it's dim. It's quite dim compared to the other one. Like, it's not, you know, end of life dim, but it's, yeah, not great. Um, but also, these are all like pastels. So, mm. anyway, let's uh, put this in manual color mode. And then... Oh, man. Oh, that's cool as hell. All right, let me explain what's going on here. I'm going to zoom out just a little bit. Okay. Okay. This is the base 16 color... CGA palette. So we're looking at just red, green, blue and their combinations and intensity. This is BBC Micro 3-bit color. So there's no intensity. It's the exact same image, except that instead of having a bright and a dark version of every color, there's only the bright version. So for instance, um, up here, we've got what appears to be a dark and a bright cyan, but what's really going on is that that's just the blue bit on the bottom and then the one above it is blue and green at maximum intensity, so you get cyan. So we're changing how we're interpreting the image, but it's the exact same image. Then when we get to the end here, this is six bit color. That's how it's supposed to look. So if we compare here, this guy has deep shadows on the back of his leg, and he's got sort of a, an unpleasant kind of green there, although that's supposed to be brown because this isn't implementing the IBM brown adjustment, but that's supposed to be brown. And then you've got this sort of bright, almost salmon color here. When we go to 64 color, look how much smoother that is. All of a sudden, it actually looks like skin tones. And we've got sort of a purple and pink going on over here that weren't otherwise possible. And there's an orange that's not otherwise possible. It's, 
it's just a little bit more depth. It's so hard to show on camera, but it just looks just a little bit better. And folks, I have waited years to be able to do exactly the demonstration that you're watching. You remember when I, um, or maybe you don't, I don't know. Maybe some of you weren't here, maybe some of you were. Several uh, streams back. Um, sorry, one moment. Okay, several streams back, I, uh, I like edited, I did some linear video editing live on camera. I'd wanted to do that for 10 years. And just like then, you're seeing me do it for the first time. Uh, no, the 6-bit color, I'm not sure what you're looking at, but. Nah, trust me, in person, the 6-bit color looks much better. Although this is kind of cool. The fact we could just punch it into uh, full brightness, um, hyper intense uh, BBC master mode is pretty neat. Um, this looks like VGA. This is unreal. I would never have believed you if you told me this was EGA. But see, the thing is, this, this nuanced color palette could have been used with games uh, like, like Commander Keen, for instance, except that when VGA came out, it had to implement an emulation of EGA for backwards compatibility, which means that for all intents and purposes... VGA simulates an IBM EGA monitor complete with its assumptions about resolution and color. You can't fake it. I don't think so anyway. I could be wrong, honestly. Like, I, I admit, I have not looked into this that deep. Maybe it's not true. But it seems hard to imagine that it wouldn't be true. And again, I think if... Uh, Sorry. How do I jump? I, f I assumed it would be up, but it's not up. How, how the fuck do I jump? Can I? Oh, there we go. Oh, okay. Okay, you've got to... Uh, I see, because um, this is very much like an Amiga game. I wonder if it's a port. Probably. I think Bitmap Brothers was an Amiga house. But um, basically, um, they assume that you only have one fire button, even though the PC had uh, two-button joysticks. So uh, if you want to jump, you have to press up and left. Or up in a, a direction because otherwise pressing up faces you up in order to interact with switches. Oh, are we in? Uh, yeah. Oh, well, and so, all right. So that's another fun. <laughs> this is another fun, uh, fun story. Let me show you what this is about. So this is mono mode. Oh, wait a minute. Wait, these work in different ways. Sorry, I've just discovered something about this monitor. Whoa. What? Okay, let me explain what's going on here. Okay, so on the front of the monitor, I've got a switch labeled text. And if I turn that on, you can see it coerces the image into 4-bit grayscale. And you can do it in either white, that's what they call this. It's really kind of yellow, but they call it white. Or amber or green. You know, whatever's more comfortable for you. But now I'm going to turn the front switch off and turn on the one on the back that's called mono. This collapses the image into one bit, not four bit. So it still honors the color switch on the front, but it only pays attention to half the bits. I'm going to switch between them like that. That's weird. That's weird. Oh, this monitor is a piece of work. Oh man, strange business. But the important thing is this. Oh, uh, why would anybody want that? Um, I think because if you're using a text editor that wants to output in different colors, and maybe those colors are like gray uh, when you'd like them to be white, or those colors are white when you'd like them to be amber, you know, um, this allows you to override uh, the image and just coerce it into a color that you like basically the size of it so anyway um yeah cool shit cool shit um i'm very excited about this uh oh right i don't want to forget we're not done i'm very excited about this 
I've been wanting to try this out for many, many, many years, and uh, I've just struggled to find the hardware for it. So now I finally have it, and awesome, awesome. Um, uh, not only that, but I've got two monitors behave in different ways, right? That's what I was going to say. I was going to point out that on this monitor, when I adjust the color mode, you can see it resize the screen, but this one doesn't because it assumes that it's it can trust the sync pulse, which it can. Of course it can. I don't know why Micro VTEC designed this one this way. Um, I'm guessing that it just, rather than actually overriding the color mode, I'm guessing that it actually uh, just pokes an earlier stage in the detection circuitry. Um, so anyway, uh, neither of these will take composite video. They will take everything else, but they won't take composite video. <clears throat> uh, oh! But speaking of ghosting, that is an interesting point. So let's uh, let's go back to this. It's such a pain in the ass moving the cable back and forth between these displays. I do it for you. I do it for you. But let's. Uh, all right. It's dur. Can we get this? Can we make this any brighter here? God, this this screen is a little tired. Unfortunately, that's the one real problem with it. Let's get some more. All right, dur. Okay, so this looks quite reasonable. In fact, it looks like if, if you didn't know better, you'd think it was a VGA display, and that's because VGA used, if I remember, if I remember correctly, VGA used EGA's settings for like like specs for text mode, or at least very very close. Um, oh, and you know what? While we're here, one more thing. We do have Commander Keen. Oh, and something you you know something you might have noticed. I'm going to show that to you again. You might have, you might have missed this. Let's exit here. Okay, you see how the screen freaks out when you start the game. Now look closely. Let's get real in here. Okay. So, this looks very crisp, very consistent. The text looks completely solid. Now I'm going to start the game. Bring, see that? Bring, see that? And now, look, scan lines. We got scan lines now. We're also in the wrong color mode. One moment. Let me fix that. Uh... Yeah, that's the guy. Whoa! Okay, I just switched it to mono mode by accident, but holy shit, that looks cool. What? What is this gonna look like? That's not as exciting as uh, before. But yeah, that like wacky XOR effect that was going on was, well, I mean, presumably that's exactly what it was. It was probably being XOR'd. Uh, okay, anyway, uh, wow, this, oh, right, 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 this looks weird and distorted because it doesn't have IBM brown, it's yellow, the IBM position isn't working, that is weird, how could that have failed, like, <laughs> that is so strange, um, but, okay, the important thing is this, overall, this looks like the game, this, this, looks it's a little dim but it looks pretty much like you'd expect from a vga monitor except of course that the uh the scrolling doesn't work right um which i don't know what that's about um but for some reason this scrolling works okay and i've seen this on ega cards before there must be some weirdness with how the this particular super cga card implements the scroll register because it's not quite working correctly i believe i've read about this it could be a dirty switch, but I've I've scrubbed it back and forth quite a few times, and yeah. Oh, wait a minute. Oh, it is changing. You see that? Maybe it is just dirty because it is there.
Man, almost. Also, again, look how cool that looks in, in full intensity. Again, it looks better in real life. Uh, all right. Anyway, you'll notice, however, this looks pretty much just, you know, video game. Great. Whatever. Looks almost like a VGA mod. Okay. Let's switch over again to the other guy, and I'll show you some things that are different. I should just put gender changes on the back of both these monitors so I don't have to keep screwing them in, unscrewing them. This is very frustrating. Or just, you know, get the right fucking cable. I, I have one cable of the correct ends, and uh, for some reason I just cannot seem to ever find the damn thing when I need it. Alright, there we go. Okay. All right, so now, boop. That looks a lot more writer -er. Like, the brown is definitely brown, as it should be. The other one was like almost sorta kinda there. Now, we still have the weird stuttering, okay? But, let me see if I can show this to you. Hmm. It's kind of hard to see, I have to admit. Well, let's just drop out to DOS. It's a lot easier to see there. Okay. Do you see it? Do you see it? See the trails? Yeah. So the ghosting on this screen is rough because it uses long persistence phosphors. Uh, I think uh, partly because it supports lower refresh rates, like 50 hertz. So in order to reduce flicker, they used long persistence phosphors. Uh, that or they just, I don't know, they felt like it? I don't know. Uh, but yeah, so long decay phosphors. Uh, it's uh, inconvenient. Inconvenient. Now, let's get weirder. Oh, whoopsie. It is there. It does not quite keep the image that long, but it's uh, it's pretty bad. <laughs> you can sort of get an impression, though, of of how bad it is just from the the screen clears. It's it's pretty uh, yeah. Anyway, so of course Windows 3 would happily run in uh, EGA. It had full support for it, because of course it did. It made a lot of sense at the time. And it looks great. It looks completely normal because, of course, uh, the VGA color palette that we're so used to from Windows 3 and Windows 95 was uh, based on EGA, or, 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 well, VGA, right? So, it looks completely normal. Yeah, there's the, I don't think, yeah, so these may look like custom colors, but they're not. Like this one here is not really an extended EGA color. It's actually uh, just a dither, because this is running at 640 by 350, so we're getting the, uh, 
we're getting the, uh, uh, um, sorry, we're getting the high resolution and it does support the 64 color mode, but I, I, you know, I just, I'm sorry, I just thought about this. Why doesn't this allow you to redefine the colors? Um, or does it? Oh, you know what? I am full of shit, I think. Is that dithered? Oh, I, no, I'm sorry. No, I'm sorry. I'm full of shit. I am full of shit. Because if we look at the solid here, okay, that's blue, sure, but that is purple, and it's claiming that it's solid. I thought it was dithered, but that was just the monitor dot pitch. Huh. Okay, uh, apparently I was lying through my teeth. They must have redefined the palette. Oh, that's right. I remember now. I'm sorry. Yes, that is true because there's at least one color in the basic Windows icon set that's absolutely not available in EGA. I think it's this one here, or uh, CGA, I should say. Um, I think it's this color right here. It's not normally available. God, this looks so much more saturated in real life. What a, what a bummer. But uh, I wish we could get an actual picture of all the available solid colors. I don't know what the uh, selected palette right now looks like. But at any rate, let us now become weirder with it. Okay, we're going to turn that off. Oh, um, am I ready for that yet? I'm sorry, I forgot to do one thing. Let me turn that back on. Uh, we've been rolling for just about two hours. Okay, cool. Uh, so normally I run for about three hours on these streams, and uh, this one started late, so I'm definitely going to be doing that. But there is... I'm going to wrap this up fairly soon here. Oh, I'm sorry. Yes. Uh, beef ingot. I was going to answer your question. Yes, that is just the shutter interacting with the way the monitor refreshes in a fucky way. <clears throat> anyway. Uh... I'm going to try and wrap this up fairly soon because I actually have a whole other thing I'd like to do. But I don't think it's going to take all that long, um, but I would like to get to it because I've been putting it off for like a good month and change. <sighs> oh, yeah, I was going to test it in uh, text mug, but there are many other things I'd like to do. So let me um, bear with me for a minute and... There we go. Terrific. There we go. Okay, so now uh, computer off. Computer off. There we go. Uh, you know what? I need to do some business. Uh, well, for the video shoot, what I'm probably going to do is I'm going to leave the camera the same, but I'm probably going to push the... Uh, I'm going to push the... Um, uh, Pardon me. The saturation in post. Let's see how that looks. I'll have to fuck with it a bit before I shoot the video. I'm glad that I tried it out here. Um, yeah, I'm not going to be using any of this as B-roll for the video. I haven't been recording any of this at high quality or anything. I'm going to want to do a much better job of that. Um, it's going to take, take me probably two days to shoot B-roll for this, this, this video eventually. Uh, anyway, I'm going to go to break. Um, you can enjoy Zircon. And when I'm back, we will do uh, some silly bullshit.
this is at uh, this is what's supposed to be happening right now and if we'll just give it a moment by the way yes all all digital VHS filters are trash except for exactly one there's I'm sorry I can't remember the name but there is a, a VHS camcorder simulator app for Android and iPhone that looks absolutely perfect but the uh, you're kidding don't tell me the fucking video dropped out. You're, you're fucking kidding me, right? No. It's back? Okay, all right. You can all see the fucked up screen, right? Jacob, I saw your message earlier. It's a shit post. I don't have an answer. So all the VHS filters I've ever seen, I don't even know where they come from because all they are is just separating the color channels. That's impossible. That cannot happen. Like VHS does not work that way. It does not think in terms of red, green, blue color channels. That That is a modern thing that... that that is a, a 2000s thing. It thinks in terms of phase. It thinks in terms of uh, phase difference from a, a reference frequency. So you simply cannot, period, ever have that kind of glitch. But more importantly, no one would ever think that that looks... I don't know what's going on here. This is not behaving as intended. I'll give it a minute. No one would ever look at that, you know, who has seen VHS and, and, and go like, oh, looks like VHS. It's literally just... What it is is easy. That's it. It's just easy. I can write a pixel shader to do that, and I don't even know how to write pixel shaders. Uh, it's it's literally, you just write a pixel shader where the only thing that it does is it just replaces all of the R values with the R value from a pixel five pixels to the left. That's it. That's your VHS filter, and they all look like that. The fact is, the only way to do it, the only way to do it is to write a physical simulation. You have to do that. You have to write a like frequency domain simulation of, uh, oh yeah, Rare Vision, that's the one. Um, and, and this is what Rare Vision did. Um, I, I don't know the story behind it. This computer's frozen, god damn it. I don't know the story behind it, I don't know who made it or, or how they made it, um, but they've very obviously done the right thing. The video is being processed in the correct uh, color domain, in the correct uh, uh, color space. And they're applying the kind of distortions that actually happen in a real VCR, which are uh, phase shifts, tracking issues, which again, like tracking errors in VHS are not equivalent to anything that ever, that can ever happen in any other type of technology. They are completely, utterly unique. And the only way to simulate them is uh, to simulate them. You have to write a, a you know, an, like I said, a physical simulation, like a fucking MATLAB simulation of uh, a VHS machine in, of the actual signal chain to make this work. And it's not that hard, but you need to actually know what you're doing. And most people who make filters don't really understand anything about signal processing. They understand pixel manipulation, which is not the same thing. You, you cannot take pixel knowledge and apply it to this problem because VHS is not made of pixels. It's made of signal. It's made of analog waveforms. And if you don't understand how they work, you will never succeed. It is, not, it is not a permutation of any set of concepts that exist in normal graphics programming or, um, or theory. It is something utterly unique to one device. So, yeah, nobody ever gets it right. <laughs> ever. It doesn't happen. And, and, and the other thing, yeah, like... The best way to get VHS distortion is to bounce video to a VHS tape. That's it. You have to do it. There are tons of VCRs available. There's ways to turn video into a composite, and there are ways to get it back into a computer, and that's what you have to do. And that's what Hollywood's been doing for decades, <laughs> since before anybody else wanted to. Anyway, uh, okay, good, good, good. We've got past where I was trying to get past. So then, welcome. 
Welcome back to the stage of history. Give it a minute. And welcome to Windows 98 in EGA. Now, okay, I'm going to let this settle. I'm going to let this settle. I'm going to let this settle. Okay, okay. And now I'm going to move the mouse. Uh, <laughs> it's happening problems. Uh, I don't think this is a visual sensitivity trigger, but it could be. So, warning. Uh, I'm going to open my computer here. It looks all right for a moment. I can see a strong bot, but it's getting eaten by some Linux or something. So, all right. Here's some spitballing Bonk. about what I think is going on here. So at first I was just utterly baffled by this and um, I posted about it and I said, I don't understand how this is phys physically possible. But that's because I was under the impression that EGA and VGA had considerably different memory space. They don't. Uh, apparently, I had, I had known that VGA used a, a planar addressing mode for video memory, but I didn't know that EGA did as well. Apparently it had something to do with enabling bank switching more easily, um, so they didn't have to expand the address space, blah, blah, blah. So uh, basically, if you give VGA commands to an EGA card, it apparently makes sense that it would interpret them correctly. Of course, it's not really. You'll notice that there's, um, there's no taskbar, and... Everything is stretched vertically. Everything is, is just a little bit stretched. And that's because what it's doing is it's drawing 640 line, 640 pixels wide, which is, okay, that's fine because EGA's high res mode does that. But then it's drawing 480 rows of memory vertically. Well, the EGA only has 350, so it basically runs off the end. It just keeps on drawing to memory that's down here somewhere. And fortunately, that doesn't smash anything. It doesn't, doesn't fuck with anything and, and, and crash the system. But the other thing is that the, the colors are wrong, right? Because this shouldn't be blue. And I think that's the only one that's obviously wrong, but it definitely shouldn't be blue. Whoops. And of course, there's also the fact that, um, <clears throat> pardon me, there's also the fact that uh, uh, it's it's all corrupted, but I think the reason for that, well, I mean, it comes down to it's EGA being fed instructions for, for, for VGA, but um, you'll notice if I move the mouse, everything freaks out, but you can see that half the time it is as it should be. Well, if I use the keyboard instead, you can see, oh, that's interesting. I actually didn't know that. Huh. Well, I was going to say, when I use the keyboard, every time I do an input, it looks fine and then it looks fucked up again. But that's actually only true for the mouse. When you move the mouse, each pixel that you move it, the screen looks right for a moment. And then when you move it another pixel, it you know looks like shit again. I think I know what's going on. Is that? No, no, no. I don't know. I don't actually know what the problem is. Sorry. I tried. Uh... But yeah, I think it's got something to do with multi multi page, uh, like like uh, double buffering, page flipping. But uh, I, I don't know, maybe I'm wrong. Somebody else was suggesting that this was caused by Windows trying to read the uh, memory uh, in order to. Um, uh, no, doesn't matter. Doesn't matter. I don't know what I'm talking about. I'm not going to bother. But I am going to go around the back of the tube here. I guess you can't necessarily tell on the camera that the colors are all wrong, but you'll probably be able to tell now that they look a lot more right. That gray is actually a gray now. And, uh, that, well, that's wrong, because that's three-bit color. But, yeah, so uh, that's in the 64-bit color, or 64-color 64, uh, 64 mode. And the reason it doesn't look right, I think, is because Windows is not populating the palette registers. It's not updating the palette registers. So it's just using the base EGA 16 colors uh, and thus they're being emitted in the 4-bit color space. It's my guess. So, yeah. Um, so this is all quite bad. But there's a reason I'm here uh, beyond this. See, this is not working as intended. But apparently it can. The uh, the VGA obviously is all, all fucked up. 
But people say that if you take the EGA driver out of Windows 3 and you put it into Windows 98, well, they say this for 95, I'm not sure about 98, but if you replace the basic VGA mode driver with the EGA one from Windows 3, supposedly it works. So we're gonna give this a shot. I uh, extracted the driver, I've got it here. And um, let's just jump into the system. Oops. Yes, so we're gonna move that. Wow. Now I've also just fucked up this copy of Windows in some inscrutable way so that it won't boot in normal mode. So we're gonna reboot and we're gonna go in in um, uh, safe mode. Oh, I see, yeah. Uh, f right only registers. Yeah, that might be it, that might be it. But I really don't know. I, I just don't have the, I'm trying not to sit around and speculate on stuff that I just don't know shit about too much, right? God damn it. Um, I think this just skipped the boot menu. And I think it's now hung. I have to, because I had a floppy in the drive. Whoops. I also don't know if this will work in safe mode. I assume it uses the same VGA.drive, but I really don't know. Oh, yeah, Blob, that's a good point. A lot of people did use that, uh, <laughs> did use that color scheme. I am sad to report that you will not be able to do hot dog stand uh, <laughs> in EGA. Well, maybe you can, actually. Yeah, this hard drive is not ideal. I think I need to replace it. So we're still going to get a bunch of graphical corruption on the startup here because when Windows tries to uh, draw the boot splash, that's going to be in hard-coded um, uh, hard coded VGA. So once it loads here, we should get the, the dancing character cells again. There they are. I had it hang here earlier. Hopefully that doesn't happen again. God, this hard drive's not doing well. I, I mean, it probably just needs to be defragged, really. Oh, okay, here we go. That's looking a little bit better already, actually. Uh, my mouse isn't moving yet, but the hard drive's still going, so the machine's not hung. Oh, oh, there we go. Oh, you see those pointer trails? Heavens to Murgatroyd. All right, so this is obviously going to work. I don't know. Maybe that's not the boot splash. I'm not really sure. Okay, and there it is. Also, apparently we have Winamp on here. Oh, right, because this is the computer I used for the, um, the creative uh, infra CD video. So yeah, that's gonna work. Can we get, can we get some, oh. Oh, right, that makes sense, because I think I took the, uh, oh, because we're in safe mode, duh, so the sound card's not running. Oh, and now Winamp is crashing. That's unfortunate. Um, but you know what, can we run Microsoft Flight Simulator? Oh, nope, nope, let's go to hell. Oh, bummer, do we have anything else on here? But yeah, I'm absolutely loving, uh, just just loving the energy here, right? Like, of course this works. Because, uh, you know, 16 colors. Um, this card will do 16 colors, so why not? Uh, presumably if we get in here, this should say, oh, right, I forgot. It's going to be cut off because this window was not designed for this. What if we, can we, oh, had they not added the ability to hide? Oh, they had, okay, cool. Oh, damn it. We still can't see it. Oh, there we go. Yep, it's ah, 640 by 350. That is the official resolution, as it should be. 
There it is. Oh. Man. Sorry, I'm just sort of transfixed. This is a, a feeling and a mood. I forgot to show you, but the screensavers don't do well uh, in, with the uh, misloaded uh, VGA mode. But the 3D ones are fine, if you want to call it that. <laughs> oh, man. Oh, that's real good. Uh, it's going to take a long time for the maze to happen. Oh, delicious. Delicious and delightful. Oh, and you know what? The colors are correct. Uh, now I think about it, like Windows has the correct gray instead of purple because since it loaded the actual EGA driver, it programmed the uh, palette correctly. Oh, man. So, oh, there we go. Yep, we're doing it. We're making it happen. And what's interesting is it's not being crushed to uh, 16 colors correctly. There's no intensity bit. Uh, they just, they're just doing eight colors. This is three bit. Also, are you liking the, uh, the trails every time the screen updates? Is that not delightful? Oh, this is so good. Uh, but what I was going to show you is that the, um, oopsie, oopsie poopsie. The flying window screensaver works fucking great because it's just very uh, straightforward. And it actually worked under the broken VGA driver as well, except that it left horrible uh, trails everywhere when it started. And then it would get going and it looked fine. Turn of the sunfish, huh? Anyway, so yeah, uh, that's it. That's uh, all the wacky EGA hijinks I had planned. So I'm going to shut that computer down. We're going to take a quick look at some other things before we go. But uh, yeah, I wanted to, to share this monitor with you because this thing is an absolute delight. Just, oh boy, talk about a brick shit house. That thing. <sighs> Micro VTech, we love you. The ghosting does does enhance it. Oh, the flying windows are, are a font. Oh, wonderful. I love it. Uh, okay. I'm waiting for my computer to shut off. I already turned the monitor off. I don't want to turn it back on to see if it's hung. But I probably should. I have this phobia of... Uh, turning monitors off and, and back on multiple times. I'm worried that it's going to burn out some component. Oh, okay, yeah. Winamp crashed and hung the machine. Okay, so that's all good. That was a rip-roaring good time so far, I hope. Sorry for how rough things may have been earlier. I was really struggling to uh, um, <laughs> get my head in the game at the beginning of the stream because... Ugh, I just had so many problems. Okay. I received something that I've been interested in for quite some time, and uh, a viewer, um, I, I forgot his name, but I think uh, I think his YouTube channel is Fat Guy with Old Computers. I think that's what he told me. Yes, Fat Guy with Old Computers is his YouTube channel handle. And he sent me um, a box of computers, an entire box. I was only expecting one. Uh, oh, my PTC camera controls are not working. Well, at least at least this... I'm glad I like this shot. <laughs> but... Um, sorry, one moment. Oh. <laughs> Okay. Uh, anyway, here is the machine that I was particularly interested in. That right there is a Data General 1. I have mentioned this uh, in one of my videos at least. Uh, this is the first laptop for 
for pretty much most intents and purposes. Let's uh, let's see if we can get another angle on it here. There we go. Delightful. Do, 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 do. All right. So, yeah, they uh, they had the prescience to name this the one. It's the technically it's the DG one, uh, I think. No, it's just Data General 1. I thought DG was part of the uh, model number, but I guess that's just something me and my friends have been saying. But, uh, yeah, I mean, I'm literally, I'm using one of my studio cameras as the stream camera here, so it's it's going to look better than it should. Uh, but let's, um, let's pop this guy open. So, this is the first computer to come in the stand, the modern clamshell approach. Um, this is from 1983, I believe. Maybe 84? Copyright 84 in the book, so I'm gonna go with that. So this is from 84, and at this point, uh, there were portable computers, but not many, or sorry, I should say portable PCs, but not very many, because the uh, compact portable had just come out, and what what few other portable machines existed were either in the luggable form factor or they were strange things like um, machines with like big tilting screens but that were otherwise sort of brick shaped um, or the screen was on sort of like a, uh, an articulated arm. Very odd stuff. This, however, just looks like a laptop. It just looks like a damn laptop. Like, yeah, it's got the caboose, but that was standard up until like the 90s. Uh, otherwise, though, it's got all the... The, basically the modern layout. We've got um, the full-size monitor, 4x3, and we've got uh, pretty much a full travel keyboard down here. We have a pair of 3.5-inch uh, floppy drives on the side, and then around on the back, um, I want to be very gentle with this because this is like very, very much a collector's item, you know, a super rarity. That's right, you got to lift it up to get this to come off. For some reason, yes, this, this is a little awkward. Oh, I may have just did I just fuck that up? Okay, no, I didn't. It's meant to come off. I just did a little a little awkwardly. It's got a little track there. Let me see if I can figure out how that was supposed to go. Oh, I see. Okay, there's there's two little tracks you have to navigate, and I didn't navigate them right. But anyway, all right. So there's your um, your power input. Uh, there's a separate battery charger input, I guess. I didn't know that. This is for a dock. They had come up with the idea of a dock already. Uh, and then you've got your parallel port and your serial port. Although apparently this is not wired in normal IBM compatible uh, pinout. They didn't do that until a later version, I believe. And then I think this could have been a built-in modem. And I think that's pretty much it for the outside. We do, of course, have this um, expansion port here. I have not opened this yet. And again, I'm trying to be very careful not use any tools or anything because I don't want to risk I don't know how fragile this plastic is I haven't seen any of these with broken plastic this does not want to come off I by the way I I've this is the first time I'm seeing this thing I looked at it in the box and that was about it I haven't really handled it in any way yeah no hard drive in 84 hard drives were not yet standard issue with uh, with PCs and I don't think that portable hard drives existed yet at all could be wrong. Uh, let's, okay, yeah, so I think that's the battery compartment, right? Let me get a guitar pick. I'm sure that's just stuck. I'm positive that's just stuck. Hmm. Wow, that really... Oh! I'm just gonna sort of pop this in here to get any stiction. Ugh, wow! It really doesn't want to go. I know there's no re there's no release for this or anything. 
I'm certain it's just recalcitrant plastic. Um, hmm. I don't want to break this live on stream in front of everybody, you know? I can see some motion. Yeah, let's double check the manual. I, I thought I'd opened it before, but you know, maybe I'm misremembering. So let's, gosh, that is a, I'm sorry I can't zoom in. <laughs> uh, let me try one more time. No, you know what? Hang on a second. Um, let me go disconnect and reconnect my damn. Hello, computer. Where the hell is the mouse? There's the mouse. Let's see. Uh... Oh, there we go. Terrific. Gosh, that is a nice looking, uh, that's a nice looking manual. Check out that cover again. That's beautiful. I love it. Okay. All in a package that weighs under 10 pounds. It is actually fairly, uh, fairly lightweight. Yeah. Um, okay. Unpack. I did not get the original, um, case for it. All right, and that is, that's the AC adapter. Uh, it goes in that right plug there, like I thought. And then nothing about the battery charger port yet. I guess maybe that's later. Okay, yeah, now we get into the, that was just the quick start. Oh, the battery pack option. Oh, okay, the battery was not mandatory. Okay, so this says, the full battery charge could give eight to 10 hours of operation, assuming you use a single diskette drive 20% of the time. Wow, that's, they actually gave their, 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 um, their test parameters for battery life. Who does that? Awesome. Oh, you can't charge the batteries while, they're, uh, while the machine's running. Oh, oh no. Oh no, if you've got it on battery and you plug in the charger, it shuts the machine off. Rough. That's why they've got the separate port for the charger, so they can put that switch in there, among other things. Uh, anyway, okay, open the cover, but, oh my gosh, whoa, I almost broke it, I almost fucked it, I thought that was a mold, uh, artifact, that is actually a release, holy shit, uh, I need something smaller than that, you gotta be kidding me, who does that? Let me go find a tool. What kind of bastard, what kind of monster bastard would do that? I did say it was old. God, I'm not sure I have anything small enough. Oh, wait, here we go. I actually do have a paper clip. Let me check real quick. Does this fit? Yeah, actually, I think it does. Let's try it again, which is the paper clip. Do what they recommend. No, I really think this feels like it's... There we go. Wow, that's quite stiff. Okay, so this doesn't have the pack. Oh, hey. Did I just see Rad Knuckles? Yeah, you, uh, you're the person who sent this to me, right? Did not realize you were in the chat. Hello. Um, yes, this does not have... <clears throat> oh, I'm sorry. Pardon me. This does not have the battery pack. Did it at one... Hmm. Uh. 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 Oh, this was a battery pack. It's been disassembled. That's the thermal fuse. <laughs> Heavens. Okay, well, there it is. My guess, my guess is that I could probably put a lithium pack in there by just ignoring the, I'm guessing that a couple of these are charging terminals and a couple of them aren't. So I could probably fairly easily uh, put a lithium pack on here that would run it for quite some time. So, all right, well, we'll think about that later. <laughs> you know, for what it's worth, I wouldn't have broken it. Um, 
I think if I had given it a little more juice, it would have it probably would have pushed that down. I don't think it would have broken anything, but still, uh, uncomfortable. Who does that? Wow. There we go. Jeez. Jeez, Louise. Oh. Well, at any rate, obviously, what I'd like to do is to fire it up. Now, I've already been informed that this has a memory error, but I would still like to see it go, since apparently it doesn't like let any smoke out if you turn it on. Also, wow. Are those accessories for the DG, are they for... Boy, that is some cabling right there. I'm guessing that's for the DG. Uh, oh, you know, actually... Okay, it's for the DG and the... Oh, right, because there is a printer, isn't there? I 100% forgot about that. Let's, um... There it is. Okay, so, uh, let's go back... Uh, all right, so here's our power supplies. Good, so that's our AC adapter for running the machine, and that's our battery charger. Gosh, these are in good condition. And, oh, it's got a separate little outlet there. What's that all about? Huh. Huh. Oh, yeah, and, um... Yeah, so this foam here, I, I, I'd seen this used before. This, I guess, is the, the chemical packing foam. Where you just, like, tear it open, and then it, uh, it expands in place. Yeah, this worked really well. Everything arrived in absolutely perfect condition. So that was, that was a good call. Anyway, so, in re the printer, if you watched my IBM PC convertible video, uh, I had mentioned there, I think, that the Data General 1 did have a printer. And this is it. And it doesn't have the cool thing... Where it clips onto the machine, but it is still a pretty damn cool printer. Um, gosh, that looks... It looks good, and it's in great condition. I'm honestly kind of astonished. Um, and then I think we've got a paper feeder here. Take a look. Whoa. So that's our paper tray, right? And that hooks in there. Yep. There's our paper tray. And then, <laughs> oh, is that OG? Sure looks and feels like it. I'm gonna open it because it's probably, oh yeah. Yeah, this has experienced some heat over the years. I don't think that's mold. I'm pretty sure that's just heat. Um, let's see if there's, oh wow, yeah, that is really, um, it's really uh, frangible. <laughs> Uh, stuff, but uh, let's see. Does it? Uh, I'm not sure if this is still going to take a mark at this point. Let's see. Let's get in here. Thermal paper, typically, if you score it with something, if it's still any good, it'll usually take a mark. But maybe this is a different... This could either be just sort of dead, kaput, or um, maybe it just doesn't respond like I'm used to. But to be honest, hmm, this is looking like it got pretty warm and from the end of the core, I'm thinking probably this is toast. I don't think this is going to work anymore. Um, I'll have to try putting it through the printer later, but at least we've got, you know, the original specimen. Not like it matters. It's just a consumable. Like, that's not something you need to worry about keeping in, you know, uh, mint condition. But it is interesting. Uh, oh, and then uh, we agreed not to bother sending over the hard side carrying case because it's just a blow mold and those things are not really worth it. But, yeah, it did come with it and there's the keys for it. Uh Impermeable stainless steel and groove frame. Lock out dirt and moisture. It was probably all right. And then we got the pocket reference. Just reminders how to use DOS, etc. And then the supplies and accessories price list. They would send you a tutorial diskette for $48. Damn. That owner's manual was $35. Bucks. 
Um, oh, a roll of paper. Oh, sorry, thermal paper. $65 for a pack of 10. So $650 a piece. Huh, okay. And then, of course, it also worked with thermal transfer. And the thermal transfer ribbon very possibly still works. Um, the battery pack was $79. And that's a 10-cell unit. So those must have been double A's, I'm guessing. Boy, that's quite pricey. Um, that hard side case was $149. Yowza. They had an acoustic coupler modem. 55. No, I'm sorry. Is that just... Hang on. Oh, no, I'm sorry. That's a 1200 bond modem. Okay. Oh, the acoustic coupler was probably for use with an internal modem. Is that what's up? All right. Well, anyway. They certainly weren't data generous. Uh, and then... Do not drop delicate electronics. What do we have here? Uh oh. Oh. Oh gosh, ribbons. Oh gosh, a 10 pack. A 10 pack of original ribbons. That, if that's carbon transfer, which it very probably is, then this thing actually has a perfectly usable printer still. <laughs> Let's take a look. What style of ribbon is this? It's almost certainly. Um, or not carbon, but uh, thermal transfer. Uh, that's what I meant to say. Uh, let's see. I don't want to break this. Usually these just pop right out. But is there a release? Is there a release that I'm not seeing? Mm -hmm. uh, okay, let's check the manual because that does not seem to want to come out. Um, oh, no, sorry. The manual said that it was thermal paper, and this is definitely thermal paper. Uh, I don't know if you remember the IBM convertible video. The printer could do either plain paper, in which case it uses a ribbon and it uses thermal the thermal head to transfer the material to the paper. Uh, or you take the ribbon out and you just put thermal paper through it and it just prints directly on uh, the paper. And this is actually nearly universal. Um, most thermal printers can do either one because it's basically free. It's uh, very easy to add. Uh, okay. Six one. I can't believe they had a, a coil cord for the printer. That is wild. Oh, okay. The second outlet on the AC adapter is for the printer. Use a little, um... There's a little extra cable in here. It just hops over to the printer. That's adorable. Oh, and the printer has its own battery. Natch, that makes sense. Yeah, there we go. That's showing it. This plugs in here, and then that plugs in there. And exactly, if the ribbons are, are carbon, then they're, they're forever. Just looking for where is it's weird. It doesn't seem to be any info about replacing the um that's gotta be in here somewhere. What? There's no info on how to replace the ribbon. Oh, here it is. Here it is. Okay, yeah, it says to just put it in there. So it's usually my experience that these are just retained by spring tension, so there we go. Oh, yeah. Yeah, that's a carbon ribbon. So, uh, assuming this thing isn't just hosed for some other reason, it should work perfectly. Huh. <laughs> awesome. Awesome. It's like a museum-grade uh, uh, set here. Honestly, goddamn. Okay. So, I'm going to have to... I know I'm going to have to do some repair on the, the main machine itself, but man, it is clearly worth it because this is a quite, quite an artifact. So uh, let's get 110 volts. Uh, MO drive. I've always been curious about MO drives. Oh, Comp Geek, that's rad. Let me know. Um, let me know what condition it's in. I'm super curious if yours has the burn in. I'm hoping it doesn't. None of them had bad burn-in, but I got so lucky that mine had none, and it'll be great if yours doesn't either. <laughs> okay. All right. Okay. 
and then okay good I thought so this folds back all uh, close to 180 degrees so let's get in here now from what I understand it is impossible to read this monitor so uh, oh sorry I was gonna say mooch the uh, MO drive uh, send me an email yeah that'd be great that'd be great thank you all right here we go Did I forget anything, or is it just that hard to see what it's doing? Hmm. 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 Or is something not in all the way? Hmm. Hmm. Oh, you know what? Sorry. I don't know. Okay, we have a power light on the PSU. That seems to be in. But before we go any further, I don't think this is related to what's going on at the moment, but let's still get that stuff out of the battery compartment just in case. Just in case. Shouldn't matter, but let's not have a bad time, eh? Oh, okay, that's the DC converter. Eh, eh. Oh, right. Oh, no, that wasn't it. That's right. You should have to push it on the way in. There we go. Okay. Okay. Let's try this again. There's no there's no smoke. I'm not getting any smoke. Hmm. I don't think anything has gone catastrophically wrong. I really honestly think that we would know if that were the case because um i think something else is afoot bear with me for a minute let me think so we've got you know what when i turn this on does this light go dim no I don't smell anything. I really, really doubt that anything has gone terribly wrong. Um, probably it's something that's just come loose in shipping, would be my guess. Oh, you know what? Wait a minute. Oh. A noise. A sound. Uh-huh. Yeah, it seems very possible to me that something has just come... It just turned on. What? The hell was that? Did y'all hear that? What the fuck? And now whatever it is isn't rattling anymore. Whoa, trippy. Don't love it. But, real quick, I'm just looking at the front here and I'm going, that sure looks... No, okay, it's going to have to be unscrewed, isn't it? I really think that something has just come loose. And that this is probably quite easy to fix. Um... Loving the blow molded case here. Let's see, what can we get a look at? Yeah, I'm, I'm positive this thing would not have a hard drive, uh, personally, I, I don't think it would. Do we need to do anything else? Typically, I would expect this to come right out with just those two screws, but I think we need to go just a little bit deeper. Oh, yeah, it's probably uh, that one right there. Hey, Sabertail. We are uh, trying to heal a Data General 1, the first modern PC laptop. 
really the first PC laptop of any stripe. Okay. Oh, no, that was that was still insufficient. Unfortunately, I really thought that would do it. Okay. Well, let's just stop going half hog and go whole hog. Give me a sec. Let me grab a driver. Oh, you know what? I don't think there's any screws under those uh, feet. Okay. Hmm, that may not have been enough either. Dang. That's a little frustrating. Oh. Is that coming or is it just an illusion? Eh, illusion, unfortunately. Let's, um... Wow, this thing is a bit of... Okay. Looks like these trim panels are just tabbed in, but it also looks like that doesn't get me anywhere useful, unfortunately. Ah, oh, damnation! Okay, let's take another tack here. Does it look like we could get the back off easily or no? I'm guessing that even if we were to um, even if we were to loosen all these screws, I suspect we would not really make much headway as far as uh, getting the top off. Let's see. Obviously, I don't want to spend two more hours taking this thing apart. It's just I'm here. Let's see, does that loosen anything useful? Mm, not really. So unfortunately this is going to have to be a larger project it appears. Uh, I am really happy about how easy these tabbed components come out. That's uh, really quite a relief because it could have been a lot harder. Although I did just almost fuck this one up by not opening the screen. <laughs> but yeah, there's just nothing going... Oh, I see. Oh. Oh, okay. I think all you do is pop these metal bands loose. And is that enough to get the top off, I wonder? I see how this works now. That's, a, that's an approach I have not seen before. Ah, uh, that is exactly it. That's all it takes. So, we may be very close to uh, an answer here. Let's just finish uh, persuading this off. Wow, this, this comes apart real easy. I like that. What a, what a wonderful machine to work on so far. Although, I mean, I suspect this was another Skunk Works project. Something where uh, engineers were allowed to do it the right way, you know? With the exception of the screen, but there's nothing they could do about that. Legendarily, the screen on this thing is so bad that it's the number one reason that nobody remembers it. Because it was just unfucking usable All right. Okay, the top wants to come off now. Anything we can do to uh, encourage it? Do we need to release anything at the back? Let's take that battery cover off again. Maybe there was a screw under there I didn't see. I don't think that would surprise anyone. Hmm. Well, I don't see anything. So I don't think any of the screws are responsible for holding on the top just because they're not long enough. But let's see. Um, 
Well, I guess there could be bosses. There could be standoffs. So let's see if that made a difference. Yeah, it did. Seems to have, anyway. No, I guess it's possible those other screws, they don't look big enough to be, uh, I assume these were holding in the board, but uh, maybe not. So let's just lose all of these, see what it gets us. Because really, I, I really think we're going to open this up and we're going to find that one connector has fallen off where it belongs. And uh, we put it in and Bob's your uncle, everything's happy. So, oh. I missed a screw. There. Okay. That's every screw that we can see. Do we... I was going to say, do we pull the bottom off instead of the top? But no, I don't think so really wants to come apart now. Oh, okay. Put the screen here and, and you know what? I'm already seeing something. You know, well, there it is. And the connector for the screen is this guy right here. And it was just sort of flopping around in the connector. So that maybe it was on for all we know. And we just couldn't tell. Um, okay, so there's the battery uh, connector, and then that's our memory cage, apparently. Uh, one moment. Okay. That connector seems fine. Okay, so I noticed that this had what appears to be a CR2032 that's been removed and not replaced. Uh, don't blame you for that, but it is interesting. I wonder, shouldn't be relevant to our problem. Now, I, I thought I heard something rolling around in here earlier. Can we extract the keyboard now? Yes. Okay, and the keyboard also just came right out of the slot. So I wonder. Oh, okay. You, oh, so maybe this was actually working and we just couldn't see. Maybe that's what it is. It looks like maybe neither of those ribbons were connected. But it seems weird, though, because it should have beeped. The other question is, what was rattling? I swear we heard something rattling, but um, nothing, nothing doing now. And then let's take a look at our. Oh, oh, oh! So this 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 board is held in by the um, by the screws on the bottom. I was right. Okay, so I just want to pop this memory expansion off for a moment and take a look at it. That's really quite a piece of work. Look at that. That is a, a little card cage. It plugs in on the board, and then it's got subboards inside of it. And there, oof, you know. Sorry, I was just thinking for a second. Um, Brad, I know that you mentioned that this had a, a memory error. Did you reseat these? In any case, I'm going to do it. Yeah, those are just connectors down there, so we can, there we go, pull that. So there's, oh, that is just adorable. Let's, um, let's get in there. Okay, you deoxed them. All right, yeah, and that connector looks super clean, so that's probably not it. Those are Toshiba TC5565FL-15 chips okay so if i need to replace those i'm sure i'll be able to find something the other thing is i don't necessarily need all this ram um, for it to just basically function so if pulling a chip uh, helps i can do that okay so let's <clears throat> 
Pardon me. Bubble memory? No, they had DRAM and SRAM at this point. Oh, and this, I like this. Uh, they just have little rubber feet that keep the RAM cage stable. Okay, all right, so that's back in. And then let's, um, let's gently the keyboard. So let's see, is this, yeah, it's that sort. I'm so bad with these ribbon connectors and often as not I end up damaging them in the process of trying to install them so I hate hate working with these old ribbons but I think I got it yeah there we go that felt good terrific <coughs> oh sorry about that okay is that seated I think that's oh there we go now it's seated okay and then let's um Oops. you know one thing i'm curious about i see what that's obviously for the lcd what's this for i have no idea Oh, okay. I hear you, Brad. That makes sense. Um, well, they they don't feel dire enough for me to worry about putting one more cycle on them. I'd like to see... Um, I think it's okay one more time. But, uh, yeah, that is a fair point now that you mention it. Encounter it, fair point. Uh... Where does, sorry, one moment. That goes under there, okay. Although it is, it's pretty damn tough to get that in the connector. Wow, that is really fiddly. <sighs> All right. Wow, that case does not love going back together. In the end, I might not bother plugging this back in right now because, yeah, geez louise, that is a tough one. Um, on the other hand, if it's going to die from just one insertion, it's probably gonna, not going to make it through repair anyway because... Uh, this won't be the first time I have to unplug and replug it. Did I get it, or is that not in all the way? That might be in. Let's give it a shot. Eh, probably not. I don't think I got it in. Well, you know... Reportedly, the screens on these things were so bad that it's hard to say. Uh, the other thing is, I expected throbbing from the floppy drive, and I'm not getting it. Uh, let me find a boot disk here. Huh. Cable came out? Like all the way? No, it's still in. It just looks like it's coming out because it's a really strange design. But the weird thing is, even if the monitor's not connected, I would expect the, the floppy drive to be throbbing right now. Unless it's just sitting at a bad memory error. Yeah. Okay, well, 
you probably have the right of it. Maybe I shouldn't mess with this until I'm ready to actually uh, fix it. Um, but anyway, uh, you know, it's just as well that I got a, a sneak peek at what the disassembly process is like because that was um, not as harrowing as I expected. I was expecting it to be a little more of a nightmare. And instead, uh, it was actually pretty reasonable. I'm going to break that damn thing if I mess with it anymore. <clears throat> yeah, maybe the, the coin cell needs to be in it. Well, anyway, putting that to one side, I'll put that back together off camera probably. Um, we do have several other items here. Honk. Wah. It is a beautiful looking machine, although apparently the, the screen is so bad that it's completely unusable. So uh, we'll, we'll, we don't want to we'll praise it too much, but I'm very excited to have it. And thank you again. <clears throat> uh, thank you again for sending it to me, as well as this one. Uh, this was also in there. I don't know anything about it. This is an NEC multi-speed, which uh, needs a little help, I think, with the... I think there's, there's a spring. There's a spring that sort of uh, engages the screen going down, but not on the way back. It just sort of plop. But yeah, so there we go. We got an NEC multi-speed. Nice. Um, oh, yeah, Mega, I did see your message. I will check that. Thank you. I'll also just see if I can find information on it. This is the sort of thing that you know, one would normally do while consulting the internet. It just looked to me like this would come off, and so I tried it, and it did. And I'm really liking that uh, it's got instructions here. Make sure you push in two locks on the hinge base with clicks when you install the panel. And that is probably because in this era, it was quite common for the LCD uh, to be very easily rep replaceable on laptops, or even just removable. And indeed, that is the case. Got our metal handle there. I don't know if this is a 8088 or a 286 or a 386 or what it is. Uh, there's our NICAD pack, 9.6 volts, 2200 milliamp hours. That's a big bitch. <laughs> big motherfucker. Um, wow, that just, uh, just sort of fell to pieces real easy, didn't it? That's fun. That's fun. I like the, uh, the instead of using the little tiny Mylar ribbon cable, they just got a normal, normal pitch ribbon cable there. That's cool. Oh, the B20? Um, yeah, I figured, I was going to say this probably does have a V20, because it's an NEC. <laughs> they made them. But um, aren't those still readily readily available? If you want one to put in something else. Um, like, did you try this machine? Did this thing work? I don't remember if we discussed it at all. Okay. So this is pretty much the same setup. Because uh, again, the, I don't know when this is from, but probably several years later. But again, the the DG one got everything right so fast. So we got the clamshell. We've got the two floppy drives um, on the back. We've got the serial, the parallel. Just very straightforward. They figured it out <laughs> right off the bat. Except this one does have a built-in modem, power switch. There's your contrast. What do we take for voltage? Hmm. Oh, wait, are they kidding? 13 and a half volts. I, I thought that maybe they were, they were naming the voltage of the battery when they said that, but no, because we know the battery is 9.6 volts. So this runs off 13 and a half volts. I don't readily have that. <laughs> is anybody shocked? Is anybody surprised that I don't have a 13 and a half volt power supply? Um... And I don't have a bench supply here at work at the moment, unfortunately. That is a bummer. I need to do something about that. There's our expansion RAM? ROM? Probably RAM. I'm not sure. Well, expansion anyway. Click. Uh, so I'll have to fire that up later. And then we've got one more. Ooh, that is heavy. This guy. Again, I know absolutely nothing about it. HP 110. Uh, is this a DOS? Is this a PC? I assume it is. Um, maybe not, though, because we've only got keys up to F8. And then a select button. 
Oh man, this is something else. Is this its own little proprietary thing? Also, the keys feel terrible. It's absolutely terrible. Um, what do we take for volts? Whoa. Give <laughs> well, so sure. I'll just pop down to the Radio Shack. Oh, come on, focus. I'll just pop down to the Radio Shack and get some of those plugs. Well, those are normal. Those are normal as hell, yeah. Wow. Um, yeah, I don't think this is a PC. I'm, I'm gonna come right out and say it. I really strongly do not believe that this is a PC. Also, more strange things are afoot. There's a, what, what's, there's a missing panel here. But even if that were there, we've got this big plastic strut here. There's a button. And then this great big, like a ground strap. I think the battery is behind that, but I could be wrong. This is, what the hell is this thing? What is this thing? So the 110 is a PC? Oh, is this run like an 8186 or something? Why does it only have function keys up to F8? Who does that? <laughs> that is strange. Oh, that is one of the worst keyboards. That is one of the worst. I would rather type on a Commodore 64 on a bread bin. That is, oh, that is horrible. The keys just jam like crazy. Uh... Wow. Oh, uh, oh, good luck with anesthesia. Uh, hope you're feeling okay. <laughs> the DG1 keyboard's wonderful. <clears throat> Pardon me. These, these, these are an even stranger profile than you can actually see, I think. Like, you gotta see this. Man, even that doesn't really communicate it. They, they feel like they've been sort of squashed and slid forward on the top. I think I'd rather type on a Spectrum. I think I would rather type on a damn Spectrum than this. Ugh. That was. That. Hmm. 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 I don't trust that. Going back to this guy, somebody asked what the keyboard sounds like. Oh. <laughs> it's not... It's not an IBM Model M, okay? I'll admit this, but... Tolerable. Tolerable, which is saying something. You know, the funny thing, so this machine is like apparently nine, nine pounds, something like that. And the NEC weighs a little bit more. And then I think that that HP 110 is like 15 pounds. It weighs a fortune. Ridiculous. Ridiculous. Also, one thing I like is that the function key was invented instantaneously, except that IBM called it function, Data General called it special. <laughs> so that's your fun. Uh, and I think, yeah, that's I think how you access these, or do you do, no, you do numlock for those. So I'm not 100% sure what the special is for. All right, anyway. Uh, all right, well, uh, so I'm going to have to come back on those, but uh, I just wanted to show you those things, and yeah, that was fun. Uh, thank you all for coming. I have no idea what those stream dropouts were about. That was really weird. Uh, my PC is performing quite well with the new hardware, though. That's good, I think. Hey, Daria, can you come here? Yeah, of course, like... Putting function in the wrong place was a practice right from the get-go. Sorry, give me a moment. What graph is maxed out? Uh, it's not maxed out. It's not? Why does it look maxed out? Uh, it, that is the GPU memory used. It's 2 gigs. Uh... Okay, so it's not maxed. How many gigs do we have on this card? It should be... Six I think it's six, right? 
Yeah, I got an Intel Arc A380, and uh, uh, it's it's acted a little weird, I think, but mostly it seems it seems fine. I think it did the job. I'll watch the stream vod later. But at any rate, yeah. Um, thank you all for joining me. Uh, that was fun. A um, little disjointed, but what else is new? And I'm looking forward to developing a video about the, the EGA stuff. That's going to be, I think, a lot of fun. I'm going to have to come back here a couple more times in the near future and, and, and fuck around um, with that machine. Also, if anybody out there has any... Uh, yeah, I got the latest drivers. If anybody out there has any EGA cards, please get in touch. I um, I would particularly like to get an IBM EGA. Um, I know that they are extremely rare, but if anybody knows where I can get one, uh, I would be willing to return it when I'm done. Um, 1,200 frames dropped across this whole this whole uh, uh, stream. That's weird. Normally it's zero, I swear. It's not zero. But okay, yeah. fair. Um, but yeah, uh, just if you can find an IBM EGA card, uh, that'd be great. I also need a Paradise VGA, or sorry, IBM EGA card. I'm also trying to get a Paradise EGA and an ATI EGA Wonder 800. So looking for, okay. Well, all right, Bradley, uh, shoot me an email. We'll see if you've got what I'm looking for. Um, we'll see if we can work something out. But uh, yeah, thank you for the DG1. Thank everybody else uh, for watching. And I got to go because I am exhausted. So. <laughs> Sorry, Adam. It happens. Oh, man, the PGC. Heavens to Murgatroyd. All right. Uh, well, everybody have a good one. Uh, drive safe. Don't eat any wooden nickels.